I am pulling a chairman's prerogative. I am passing my invocation off to Board Member Rutledge. Please rise for the invocation. As Robert Frost wrote in The Road Not Taken, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. In the spirit of a new year, a new board, and new beginnings, let us all strive to take that road less traveled. Let us try to communicate effectively by focusing less on word choice and more on the meaning of the message. Let us be diligent in addressing what people actually say and not what we think we heard. Let us be mindful to not characterize a disagreement as a failure to listen. Let us always be respectful of others, even when we may be opposed to their contention. Let us refrain from dwelling on the mistakes of the past while remaining conscious of the lessons they have taught us. And let us persevere to work together as a board, a school system, and a community in the best interests of the students we serve. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless America. Thank you, Mr. Rutledge. That was moving. Uh, just one quick announcement. Welcome home, Janina. <laughs> and uh, could I have, oh, fire evacuation. The fire evacuation is through the doors in the back, out to the parking lot, or to my left, your right, and to the left, down the stairwell, and out to the back parking lot. And there is also an AED available on this floor in the, lobby, in the main lobby. Kathy, could we have roll call, please? Mrs. DePoe? Present. Mrs. Hernandez? Present. Mrs. LeBlanc? Here. Mr. Neville? Here. Mr. Renier? Here. Mrs. Riley? Here. Mr. Rutledge? Here. Mr. Ryder? Here. Chairman Krizel? Here. Thank you. Uh, board guests, Mr. Mr. Jezik? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I want to apologize to the Registrar of Voters. When they originally requested to be on this meeting date, I suggested the second meeting in January because we knew we had a full agenda. However, when we put it on the agenda, we put it on the wrong one. So I was contacted by the Registrar this morning saying, am I supposed to be there? And the answer is no. They're scheduled for the 23rd. So we do not have any board guests tonight. But we do have. Could we could we take care of JFK now? or? I, I'm, I'll address that in Superintendent's report. Okay. Sounds like a plan. So that is number seven, superintendent's report. Mr. Drezik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Both of our student reps are here, so ask I that you begin with that. Names, so why don't we stop? I'm sorry, Megan. I apologize. It's all right. Uh, girls basketball won their game last night, 44 to 34. Uh, there's a jazz and concert band performance next Thursday at 6.30. The musical started their auditions yesterday, and midterms start the 24th, and then the term will come to a close after the 29th. Thank you, Megan. Matt? There is a orchestra and jazz combo concert in the Enfield High School Auditorium on Thursday, January 11th and the Enfield Instrumental Music Association is holding a comedy night fundraiser on Saturday, January 27th. Thank you, Matt. Mr. Drezek. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm actually gonna go out of order because in the event Mr. Salgowski has some questions, I'll have, give him, I'll let him go last in the superintendent's report. Um, to give you an update on snow days, as of today, we have used three snow days for school closings on October 30th, January 4th, and January 5th. Um, in addition, there's an extra day at JFK, as you all know. So the projected last day of school currently is June 20th, and the set graduation date is June 21st. So let's hope the January thaw lasts until April. Um, enclosed in your packet is a draft copy of the 2018-2019 school year calendar. And per your board policy, the board has to set the actual calendar dates calendar date in February. And just to give you a little bit of background on the calendar process, we will typically run this calendar not just by the um, our president of our Enfield Teachers Association, but also the Administrators Association, um, which is not necessarily outlined in your policy, but it's always been a practice that we've done so everyone has an understanding as to uh, what the projected calendar would be for the following school year. We did make a slight change this year that I want to address with you. Um, the challenge for next school year, uh, when it comes to April vacation, is if the typical we're, we're not required though it was part of state law um, it's been extended for an additional year so we're not required to use a regional calendar through our, our RESC however 
we have gotten into the practice of trying to align our days off, in particular our uh, school vacation schedule, aligned with other districts. One of the challenges was when you look at the April vacation calendar, some districts were trying to take some liberties with using April vacation on the week of the 15th so they can utilize Good Friday as being an off day. Um, and when we initially looked at that, um, we looked at uh, surrounding towns and we would be the only town that would be utilizing the week of the 15th as April vacation. So when we bump April vacation up a week to April 8th through the 12th, um, it ran into a little bit of a challenge when it came to our end of our last day of school with regards to our set graduation date and the addition that we might need to add days for snow. If we were to keep April vacation um, under the current schedule and the other the other difference in this calendar than you've currently seen is the Wednesday prior to Thanksgiving. As you know, for the last two years, that's been a complete off day for students and for staff. Some of you will remember the reason that we had to do that is that has typically up until the last two years have been a half day of school and that counts as a full day. Two years ago, we had to change that because our faculty at Enfield High School were moving during that period of time from the existing building to the steam wing. So to allow teachers the opportunity to move, we made it an entire day off. It remained in the calendar for this current year as a full day off. If we were to keep that as a full day off, that would push our graduation date until Friday, June 21st. There's a couple of reasons that graduating on a Friday evening is not typically a good idea. Um, one of them, besides the obvious, is that in the event we extend our built-in five snow days, that means if we have to come beyond graduation date, we have to bring people back the following week, which means students and staff would have to return on June 24th. In the event of a terrible winter, we're getting dangerously close to the July, to June 30th deadline. So I did reach out to both, um, as I mentioned, to both presidents of the union and say that I was gonna recommend we go back to the day before Thanksgiving as an early release day, and that allows us to have the last day of school on record for students as June 14th with a, a firm graduation date for June 20th, which is a Thursday. So you don't have to take any action this evening on it. You do have to take action per policy in February, but I'd like to give you guys enough time in the event you have questions between now and when you have to adopt sure. it. Uh, Martin Luther King Day, all Enfield Public Schools will be closed on Monday, January 15th for students and staff of op in observation of Martin Luther King Day. There is a list of January events in your packet. I will not read them all. Some of our board reps took the liberty of reading some before me, so I appreciate that. Uh, there's one other thing on here I didn't want. I just got an email two minutes ago from Mrs. Gates. You guys know Lori Gates who runs Reads Across America, letting us know that thanks to our friends at ETV, the Reads Across America service that was at Parkman last month is now live on ETV if anyone has the right to, uh, anyone has the, the, um, the need to want to go watch. I would encourage anyone who has the opportunity to watch the event. And lastly, I will give you a JFK update. I'll try to keep this as brief because at this point you're all probably sick of hearing my voice on the robocall system or you were confused and shocked that it wasn't Mr. Brass and it was not, me not myself. Yet. Not yet. It's only two or three we were, it was you three. were pushing it. Yeah, three. Um, you already broke one rule that I was trying to stay off of that thing for at least a year. Um, so thank you for that. And I blame Mr. Sargalski. Um, I'm kidding. I'm going to give you a brief timeline update as to what got us here and where we are now. And I've asked Mr. Sargowski to be here tonight because there's a lot of things that he could talk about that happened in the building that he could better explain than I could and give it more justice to. I'm not going to relive everything because, like, like I said, you've all heard my rather lengthy messages that went out to family and staff. Um, but essentially, we were notified um, per Mr. Sargowski on January 2nd, the first day back from recess, um, that some of the rooms in the building were cold. As most of you know, if you've been around schools long enough, that's not typically uncommon, particularly when you come off of a, of a winter recess break. Um, when the buildings are vacant, they're not heated to full capacity. So as we start to get back toward the first day of kids returning to school, they crank the boilers up. It is not uncommon for the first day of school for some rooms first thing in the morning to be colder than others. Now, typically, they will warm up as the day goes on, and we never hear about it. Um, in this particular case, Mr. Sargowski noticed that there were pockets of the building that were colder than others. The entire building did have heat in it, or I shouldn't say the entire building. A large majority of the building had heat in it, um, but there were parts of the building that weren't, the temperatures weren't rising as, as students were starting to come in. So immediately the administration of the school went around to the classrooms that were designated as being cold <coughs> um, and asked those teachers and those students to relocate to other parts of the building that did have heat. Um, one of the things that I heard, and I'll try to address the best I can, is when events like this happen, 
Um, and I think this was evident in an issue we had at Enfield High at the beginning of the year. We can't always control what the message that gets out into the public is before we have an opportunity to explain what, is, what reality is happening. So I was getting questions about degrees in certain rooms throughout the day and kids were told that they had to wear a snowsuit the next day to school and all these things that I don't know where they originated from, but I can tell you that that's not actually what happened in the school. What happened in the school was the administration went around with teachers and tried to relocate any room that wasn't warm enough for kids to be in it into a part of the building that was warm for kids to occupy. Um, we immediately reached out to buildings and grounds and then they re when they re made the realization that there were two boilers running the, the school, one of them went down. Um, and that's why there was heat in parts of the building and not in others. They immediately tried to put remedies in, buildings and grounds were there from the minute we notified them and they're still right there now. I got an email two minutes ago to give you a final update on the progress of, this, of, of, of everything that happened over there. Uh, at that point, like I said, Mr. Sargowski and the administrative team over there went around and made sure that kids were in rooms that were warm as best they could. Now there were some teachers who said, it's actually not that bad in here, we'll stick it out. Um, there were cases where the administration went around and teachers went around and told kids, if you'd like to put a coat on, if you're cold, you certainly could put a coat on. I heard somewhere, someone had sent me a question saying that the school was making kids put coats on because it was unsafe. That's not necessarily true. Um, there were some teachers that I've heard that asked kids to put coats on, not because the temperatures in the building were unsafe, but because some of those kids chose for some reason on a day that was four degrees out to come to school in a short sleeve t-shirt. So some of the teachers went above and beyond and said, why don't you put your coat on even if you're in a regularly heated building, it's still too cold to be wearing a t-shirt now. Um, at that point, we were in communication with buildings and grounds. I was in communication with the town manager throughout the day. Um, Mr. Sargowski was constantly on the phone with us more than he'd like to be for the entire day. And the hope was that the temperature was beginning to rise throughout the day. And the hope was either they would find a remedy to fix the, the boiler that had gone down or that the building was warming up enough so that we can get those kids back into those pockets of the building that were too cold. Um, at the time, we fast forward to, that was on Tuesday on the 2nd, on Wednesday the 3rd, the building had gotten a bit warmer. There were some classrooms that were warmer than the day before, but there were still pockets of the building that were too cold to put kids in, in our opinion. So Mr. Sargowski did the same thing on the following day, went around and asked, and essentially went around with the custodian with a thermometer, and any buildings, any rooms that were below 60 degrees, he asked the teachers to relocate for the day. At that time, I was having a conversation with the town manager and the buildings and ground staff. Um, where they came to the realization that they were gonna to have to try to acquire a temporary boiler to get us through the remainder of the heating season. Uh, a temporary boiler I knew nothing about, um, but I can tell you it's essentially a trailer that's wired into the building with pipes and all that stuff that you guys know a heck of a lot more about than I do. But they were gonna to need to go to the town council that evening on Wednesday to get an appropriation to pay for it. One of the discussions I had with the town manager at the time was, on Wednesday we anticipated that a blizzard was coming on Thursday. So we knew in all likelihood that school was going to be canceled on Thursday. Uh, and I had thrown out the suggestion to the town manager that in the event a new boiler had to be purchased and installed or rented or however it is they were going to procure it, that if it was going to take more than the snow day, that if canceling school on Friday was beneficial for them to get in there and remedy the problem, that's something I would consider because at the time I was getting information that Friday looked like it might be a snow day as well, even though the blizzard had ended, the cleanup and the low temperatures was something all superintendents were considering on Friday. The initial hope was that between Thursday and Friday and the weekend, by procuring a new boiler and getting it, getting it on site, that the installation company would have enough time to install it prior to Monday and kids coming back to school. I was notified late Wednesday evening that the council did authorize buildings and grounds to get the temporary boiler. Because of the age of the equipment, some of the fittings that go along in the boiler had to be custom made. That customization of the fittings began immediately Thursday morning. I had conversations, now obviously we canceled school on Thursday, so we were having conversations on Thursday about the best way to move forward with this when I was given information that unfortunately, it's about an eight hour process to install the temporary boiler. And one of the challenges that they were facing was A, there was a blizzard on Thursday, so getting the parts here and time to install on Thursday was not going to be an option. And it was questionable whether the parts would actually arrive on Friday. Um, the other concern was even in the event that the parts did arrive on Friday and they were able to, to start installing it, you have to completely shut the building down of heat in order to replace and put a temporary boiler in. And in doing that, there was a general fear from the contractor that the water in the remaining boilers would still be in the pipes 
and with record low temperatures that were expected to be coming on Friday and Saturday and Sunday, there was a fear that shutting the building down during this time period really exposed the remaining pipes in the building to freeze and we'd have additional issues that we were, were hopeful we wouldn't have. So at that point, it was asked of me if canceling school on Monday would be an option. Um, I immediately asked Buildings and Grounds before I agree to anything, I want to guarantee that this will be taken care of on Monday and that kids will be able to resume in a warm building come Tuesday morning. Uh, they didn't give that to me right away. I give them to their credit. They called the contractor and whoever had the call on their side. They got back to me shortly and said that we have a guarantee that if there is no kids in the building on Monday because of the eight hour process, one of the other fears and concerns, just to not to make this longer than it needs to be, but I've gotten a lot of questions, um, was part of because they're installing the parts and it's an eight hour job, if they were to start it on Friday and for some reason ran beyond five o'clock on Friday evening and needed to get a part, their suppliers wouldn't be open. And then they would expose the building of having no heat over one of the coldest weekends on record. So that's why Monday was really the only feasible option for them to install the, the temporary boiler. Um, they confirmed that build, the building would be up and running. We went the weekend. We were notified first thing Monday morning with yesterday when they had started. We were getting periodic updates throughout the day as far as what part was being installed, where they were in the process, uh, until about 3.30 yesterday afternoon when I got an update and I asked for confirmation from uh, the Deputy Director of Buildings and Grounds, Am I, would you advise me, send, I need to send a notification out to families that were on schedule, Do I, I'm using this email as a confirmation to do so. I was replied back immediately, yes, that's totally appropriate to do, everything's going on as scheduled. Um, so we were under the assumption that going into today, the new boiler would be up and running and no one would know anything. Uh, I did get a call from Mr. Sargowski first thing this morning and said slight hiccup. Uh, it wasn't totally up and running on the new one, but the existing one is heating the building appropriately. There was one classroom in Blackwing that Mr. Sargowski deemed was a little too cold to put kids in. The interesting thing is we're not 100% certain that it's related to the actual boiler. As you know, we are a public school in an older building in New England that isolated incidents in classrooms still do happen, regardless if you've been shut down for three days for a boiler replacement. We're leaning that that might be the reason, but I don't have confirmation on that. Um, but I was given an update later at uh, 3.30 this afternoon saying that the boiler was in and running and the backup boiler, which was the one heating the building for the last three days, will now go back to its purpose of serving as a backup. And about five minutes before we started this meeting, I got it working out few remaining kinks, but temp boiler is running. Boiler one will continue operating as backup. I'm going to take that as everything's up and running at JFK as normal. So though there was a few kinks this morning, I did not get any complaints about cold rooms. I'm, I don't know if you did. If you did, you didn't forward them to me. Um, so I'm assuming that everything went good. We've had conversations with Mr. Sargowski all day, and he hasn't had any complaints there were outside of the one classroom we had to relocate. Um, I dragged Mr. Sargowski out here tonight because during this three to four day period, um, particularly last week when students and staff were in the building and it was a bit cold. Um, he started to share with me some of the things that students and staff were doing, either addressing the problem, making it a learning experience, even as little as emailing staff to say, hey, I know you're in the cold part of the building. I have a prep period. Why don't you bring your kids down here and maybe we can bring all the kids together for a class. There was a lot of good that came out of what could have been an, or, an ordinarily uncomfortable situation. So I asked Mr. Sargowski to come because he can articulate that a heck of a lot better than I can. But as far as the progress and, and the situation as it un, un, unlaid itself, that's what happened at JFK. I know there were a lot of things out there. Um, believe me, I got contacted by the news media on an hourly basis hearing different stories, hearing different room temperatures, hearing that there were icicles hanging off of chairs. I, I, I can tell you that none of it's true. Um, I can spend my day chasing those stories around, but in the reality, when you get a message from me, that means I have fact. And the three messages that I sent out during that process was because I thought it was imperative to get fact out as quickly as I can. The last thing I'll add is that when we made the decision to close on Monday, we also made a decision to notify everybody in the community on Thursday that we were shutting down on Monday because we realized that it was an inconvenience for parents um, having to make otherwise you know, child care arrangements, uh, as well as for staff, because they have children of their own. They have schedules that they have to try to keep. Um, so we wanted, the, the minute we were, I was given confirmation that Monday would work and Tuesday would be back up and running is when I called Mr. Brass and said, show me how to use this thing again. I got to send a note out. So that went longer than I hoped. Um, but at this point, I know Mr. Sargowski's here. Uh, if he has, if you have any questions directly for him, um, he's certainly more than willing to answer. I'm going to make him answer because I've answered all these questions about JFK for the last week. Um, 
or if there's any comments or anything you'd like to hear from Mr. Sargowski, I'd ask him to come to the dais. Please, Mr. Sargowski. Welcome, sir. Thank you. I don't know if the mic's on. Is the mic on? Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay. Is that better? Much better. Well, I want to extend from the board that all the, you know, all the New Year, all the New Year stuff you did the last week and a half or week. Thank you very much for all the hard work we did to get this to get this going. And and uh, and if you have any, she said you may have some stories if you want to share with us, please. Sure, I, I want to thank you also for all your support through you know the little glitches and hiccups that we had, but it's still on. Is that on now? Oh, there oh I'm we go. sorry. There I, we go. I pushed. I made you push sorry it. I'm that. sorry. Um, My fault. Yeah, and, you know, I, I uh, want to thank uh, Mr. Dresick and Mr. Longy and, you know, Central Office. We were communicating an awful lot and, it, you know, just made it easier um, to have them available. And, you know, I, I, th I thought it went as, as well as it could. Um, you know, boilers are old. Uh, sometimes it takes a while for them to get going after a long vacation. That's pretty typical, you know, in most buildings in, 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 in this district. And, uh, you know, we, we just uh, I have a very resilient and positive staff. I'm very lucky with the staff that I have at JFK, uh, and we, they, you know, they were the, the f right, right as, as soon as we found out that there were issues, um, they started emailing each other. Like Mr. Dresick said immediately, uh, you know, my room's toasty. Um, it's pretty warm here. My my prep is this period. My team time is this period. Come on over and use the room. You know, so there was an awful lot of that going on those, those first two days, where where. Uh, you know, classes that were a little colder couldn't move into a warmer section of the building. Um, we also were able to move the sixth grade um, classrooms out of the white wing, which was pretty cold on that first day. Uh, they moved to the library by the second block of the day. Um, you know, so it was like our big seventh and eighth graders were taking care of the little ones and, you know, allowing them to have the warmer uh, spaces in the building while they, you know, kind of hunkered down where they were. Um, I want to reiterate with, 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 uh, what Mr. Dresick said. At, at no time was there no heat in the building. There was always heat in the building. Um, there were just a couple pockets of the building that were a little chilly and, and weren't quite receiving the, you know, the, the adequate heat that they normally would. Um, we've also um, renamed our boiler that worked. We had one boiler that worked throughout the whole process. That's now called the little boiler that could. <laughs> Uh, because it it was the smallest of the three boilers, but did did a pretty decent job. Um, uh, some other things that the, the faculty we had a couple uh, math and science teachers talking about average temperatures. We were walking around the second day with our laser um, thermometers, and you, you basically take a ceiling, floor, wall temperatures, and then you could determine you know through averages you could determine the air temperature. And uh, you know so teachers were you know, talking about average temperatures. Some science teachers were, were talking about ambient temperatures and how to determine ambient temperatures. So they're kind of spinning this into a little educational program. Uh, we, we had some students bringing in, uh, the second day, bringing in really fun blankets. You know, they had their monkeys all over their blankets and, you know, their unicorns and all those kind of things. And, you know, it was just really a fun, a fun day for the kids the second day because they got to wear hats that they normally don't <laughs> wear, you know, ski hats and things like that. Um, so, you know, just, you know, pulling together, um, you know, and we, we made the best of it and really wasn't too much of an issue, to be honest. Any questions? Please, Tina. Um, I, have, I have more of a comment. Um, my son goes to JFK, as you know. He's in eighth grade. He's in Black Wing. Um, yeah. uh, he did not uh, feel that the temperatures were an issue. He said it was cold, but he didn't feel that it was too cold. And then... On Wednesday, he didn't feel good right before we left for school. So I like called the absentee line and said, "He's not in because he's sick. It's, it's not because not, it's cold." Yeah. Um, and then we were in the gym on Saturday for rec basketball, and it was actually kind of stuffy in there. And then today, I happened to ask my son, and he said it was warm wherever he went. Yeah. So, um, and he wears short sleeve t-shirts and sweatpants because usually he complains that the building's hot in the middle of the winter. Um, last Wednesday, or last Tuesday when he got out of the car, I said, you know, keep your sweatshirt on all day. It's like extremely cold out today. You don't need to be wearing a short sleeve shirt in school. And he ended up keeping his sweatshirt on. Yeah. 
What's interesting, though, is I appreciate you coming and talking about the teachers because <clears throat> I bumped into a teacher at the grocery store over the weekend. And it's interesting um, how, uh, you know, like Mr. Dresick saying, this stuff takes on a life of its own on social media. And I feel bad because some of the teachers were were pretty offended by some of the stuff that was going on because they had felt that the students were dealing quite well with it, that the, the students weren't in danger. Um, yes, that some rooms were cold, but um, they were working through it and taking the opportunities, like you had said, to talk about temperature and different things like that. And um, at no point in time, I don't think that, that any poor judgment was used. Um, as far as, as the coldness of the building. Um, I can say that as a parent, because I have a son that actually was physically in the school that yeah. day. So um, thank you. I think um, what happened to JFK is just something we're gonna have to actually look as a bigger picture because it could be a very long cold winter and we have a lot of older school buildings with old boilers and, and drafty, drafty windows. So, but thank you very much for coming out and um, you know we appreciate the communication. So thank you. Thank you. Former principal from JFK. Yeah, Charlotte was first. No, Charlotte, what's okay. your okay. okay. Um, I just want to say thank you so much, especially since you took me on a tour last Wednesday of everything that was going on, and it was, it was great. Thank you so very much. You did a great job. Um, I also got to meet some of the people from facilities and custodial services that day, too. Um, so I wanted to thank you since you're here. And um, I also wanted to thank all the teachers, the students, staff um, for their patience and buildings and grounds facilities and custodial services for their expedited service during the brutal cold spell but thank you very much you did an awesome job You're very very welcome that. <laughs> now former principal of JFK to the current principal of JFK <laughs> thanks for being here Steve uh, uh, having been through this kind of stuff which is unfortunately routine it happens it, it happens okay although I heard in the news this morning the weather I think we were at 13 days in a row and I think that's like number eight in the history of the, of the span of day, no, days over the last 125 years so it's kind of a rare occurrence but it is in New England and that's what we have in terms of the black wing and the 19 years I was principal those rooms down the old art rooms down, yeah. they, they're at the end of the cycle they're at the end of the run you could send it Farthest down to 120 the degrees down there. It's probably 30 by the time it starts to come back, you know. So that's always been a problem area. Uh, but uh, hopefully that will get fixed when we get the uh, a referendum through. Um, I, I know uh, looking at Facebook, which I don't often do intentionally, uh, I don't subscribe to it because it's not always giving the facts. Um, but if you were to look at Facebook, and my wife kept pushing it in front of me, be all the stuff that was going on there, it was like listening, watching a different school system at work. Temperatures are like this, they've been like this for a week, nobody's done anything about them. And knowing what I know about the staff, both at JFK and in this district, I know most of them, probably 20, 30, or 40 years, both your staff, the custodial staff, the administrative staff, I know them on a first name basis. And I know the loyalty that they have to these kids. They'd put those kids ahead of themselves in terms of their safety and in terms of making them comfortable. And uh, I know that uh, we don't need any uh, guidelines for them to do it. They use, use common sense, and they get it right. done. When they see cold, they'll get them to warm. They'll, you know, if they need them to get a coat, they'll get a coat. When the kids come in in shorts and it's four degrees out, which they do, as you well know, yeah, okay, they they'll not only get them in, they'll call their parents and <laughs> say kind of the first sign of intelligence is knowing how to dress for the weather, you know, that kind of a thing. But, you know, I, I don't think we can, now everybody's reiterating here, but I don't think we can thank enough you guys, central office, the uh, uh, grounds, not the grounds guys, but the uh, DPW guys, the buildings and grounds guys, for all the work that they do. And, and I mean, teachers, secretaries, paras, everybody that's in the building just jumps in and helps out when it's a time like that. And I, and I, I guess I want the people who are writing the stuff on, on Facebook, who are writing what I call lies, okay? It disrupts parents, it upsets them, it upsets kids. I don't understand why it happens. I thought we had excellent communication from our own central office people, from you guys. Very, very detailed, told us exactly what we needed to know, and dealt with it not as if it was a crisis. This was an event. A crisis is like 9-11. A crisis is like, you know, a death. This is not a crisis. This is an event that we're used to dealing with. And, and, we, and people just respond. You almost don't have to tell them what to do. We have and a that's good... That's honestly what it was like. It was, we were on autopilot really throughout the whole I thing. never worried at all. I know what you guys do. I know what, that people just instinctively respond because they know what to do. 
and they care about those kids intensely, uh, almost as much as their parents do. And I think we have to get that message out there. Please trust us. Don't listen to, to uh, Facebook. We're doing the right things. If we have a problem, you guys are going to get in touch with those parents or get them out of the school, do whatever we have to do to do that. Right. And, and I, I think that's the message we need to get out there. Right. Not, not. And we have, we have some, we have a lot of great parents and, and I really appreciated people. a lot of them that called us to get the correct information. That's the first thing they said, I'm hearing this, this, and this. We want you to tell us, because you're in the building, we want you to tell us what's happening mm -hmm. in there. And you know, we tell them a few facts. Oh, thank you for the information. And, and they were off the phone. You know, so there was a lot of that that was going on too. I think the vast majority of, 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 of folks just trust you guys. They put the kids in touch. You've got a good reputation. Yeah. I think that's Thank what we you. want to hear. You know, I, I, I think the intentions are probably good and people trying to get messages out there. But unless you have the facts, you're sending the wrong information. So please kind of refrain from it, not you, but the, these folks. And let's leave our professionals act the way they always do yeah. in a professional way. So thank you. If you can get the message back to your we'll, staff, we'll do. every one of your staff back to them, how yeah. much we appreciate what they do in these types of uh, events. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I also want to publicly thank our custodial staff, DPW and facilities. They, they were phenomenal. They were in the building every day helping us through the whole thing. You guys had people there 24 hours a day, didn't you? Yeah. With yeah. that boiler, nursing yeah. that boiler yeah. through? <laughs> yeah, that was the other one. Not the little boiler that could. That was the other one that was <laughs> the half boiler. But they're all, yeah, they're all working now. You get a gold star, all of you guys do. <laughs> Any other comments? No. Thank you again. Hi, and just to, re 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 just to say it again, it was never colder in the building than it was outside, okay? Because that was on Facebook. <laughs> not, not even close. It's colder inside than it is outside. Uh, people, common sense tells you that's impossible. You'd have every pipe burst in the building if that was the case. You'd be the icicles in the building never happened so again thank the staff thank everybody 100 percent great job you guys did and to avert thank you all very much situation too. and thank you for coming tonight mr dresick any more outside of i do like the kid with mr sargalski a lot but i do want to take the chance to thank him again i'm not his evaluator anymore so i can say it um he he handled it for i said he, he definitely earned his stripes during this process and and as a lot of you have reiterated um, neither Mr. Longy or myself ever had any questions about Mr. Sargowski's the way he's handling the building and handling the situation. He handled it flawlessly. So thank you again, Steve. Um, and that will conclude my superintendent's report. Okay. So we have uh, audiences. Uh, there is no audiences. So uh, just the last call. Anybody want to speak in front of the board? So I, clo I, close, I close audiences. So we have board member comments. Um, who wants to start? Mr. Rutledge. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just, uh, just a few comments for this evening related to uh, some things from uh, actually the last meeting. Um, first of all, uh, regarding communication, as I did in the last meeting, I'm going to continue to give out my uh, email address and phone number. My email address is still crutledge at enfieldschools.org, and my phone number is still 860-253-2546. If people have questions, um, comments, concerns, I implore them to reach out. We definitely want to provide answers and address issues uh, where we can. Um, we always appreciate when people come to the dais here and uh, you know speak their mind. But if um, but if people really want answers or understanding, it's really best to communicate with us beforehand. So that way we can at least look into issues or we can forward them to the appropriate departments um, for resolution. Um, remember, there are definitely going to be things we can't discuss. For example, things related to personnel, things related to student privacy. We won't be able to discuss those issues. But um, you know, if there are concerns, please forward them to us and hold us accountable if we don't respond to you. Um, come here and say, Chris, I sent you an email. Why haven't I heard back from you? Um, that'd be on me. That'd be a mea culpa. But um, I can assure you that if I get inform if I get requests via email or phone, I'll do my best to um, uh, to address those. Um, second of all, at our last meeting, somebody asked a question about air quality and school security committees. Um, I just wanted that person to know that I have forwarded them over to Mr. Dresick, um, our superintendent, um, and that for reasons related to procedure, I'll defer those to uh, you at some point to um, discuss. Um, 
Regarding buildings, at previous meetings, questions were related to the Board of Education's involvement in buildings and whether um, we care about our buildings, the school buildings. Um, at the risk of putting words in anybody's mouth, I feel very confident saying that every one of us up here cares about the quality of the buildings um, of our school system. Um, just because somebody may state that building maintenance falls under the responsibility of the town, that should not be equated with the sentiment that we don't care. Of course, we care about where our children go to school and the quality of those buildings. I know the Joint Facilities Committee has done a great job um, prioritizing some of those repairs that are needed. Um, and I'm sure as that committee goes forward, they'll uh, you know continue to do so with the same gusto. Um, and uh, also regard my last comment is that uh, somebody also at a last meeting asked us all to think about what our vision is um, for the Board of Education. And I've thought a great deal about this. Um, at a very high level and at the risk of sounding cliche, my vision is definitely in line with our uh, you know, motto of making a difference in children's lives every day. Um, but at a more granular level, um, I would say my vision for this board is for us all to work together, to build bridges between ourselves and the system and the community, um, to, to work on providing better opportunities and to encouraging students to take advantage um, of those opportunities, whether or not they're on culinary, manufacturing, or AP um, tracks in school. And it definitely involves fostering better communication, which is why I continue to provide my contact information um, at uh, every meeting and why I'll continue to listen and work with my colleagues on the board, um, as well as my constituents and the community at large. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rutledge. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Mr. Ryder. Just wanted to say <clears throat> Happy New Year, our first meeting of 2018. Welcome back from uh, Blizzard Brody and his snow days. I have a kindergarten friend at Hazerville and his name is Brody, so he was excited that it was Blizzard Brody. Um, just wanted to say that Whitney Wolves are leading the pack. Um, uh, my report this week is about the Eli Whitney School PBIS lessons. Uh, they're underway. Um, and one thing they're doing with PBIS, which I know a lot of the schools are doing, but um, they're actually applying, teaching the lessons where they apply. So if we're talking about hallway etiquette, the whole classroom will go out in the hallway. We'll talk about hallway etiquette. This is where it happened, so let's learn it in that facility, in that, in that area. If we're talking about cafeteria etiquette, we'll learn it down in the cafeteria slash all-purpose room. Um, so I thought that was very neat. I was speaking with Mr. Brooks about uh, some Eli Whitney updates today. Um, an anecdotal, he was saying that he saw more um, respect of like the school grounds. For example, uh, they were talking about paper towels in the restroom. Towards the end of each school day, they would just be all over the floor. You could tell that they'd lived a kid's day, um, but he's seeing a lot less of that. Um, and again, we've only been back a few days, so <laughs> could be a new resolution um, from some of the litterers or could be uh, anecdotal, but it, it was nice to hear that. Um, there's an in-house uh, pep rally uh, assembly, if you will, uh, this Friday towards the end of the school day. And he also wanted me to reiterate to all the Eli Whitney families that um, as far as the monthly assemblies that they had been used to in the past, they are going to start up again next month. Uh, he just wanted to get a few months under his feet, a uh, new administrator in a new building, as well as getting the PBS program uh, underway. So the teachers were learning exactly what PBS was. The students were learning what they were. So the monthly assemblies will be PBIS based. Um, and they will start up again, and parents will be invited uh, to these assemblies, and he's looking to get that up and running again mid to late February, um, and they'll be monthly thereafter. Um, and that's it. That was my, uh, my good news for the week. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. No, go ahead. Ms. Ms. Hernandez. Yeah, um, so my, <clears throat> excuse me, my good news for the week uh, was that I had the opportunity to visit Head Start. Um, I am the liaison for Head Start, and I could not be more thrilled about that. My uh, professional career actually started with Bristol Head Start. Um, I was their bus monitor and then moved up to assistant teacher and then head teacher. Um, so this is a real privilege for me. And upon entering, um, I, the staff uh, could not be more welcoming. Um, and they, I had the opportunity to observe the children, um, and I could not be more thrilled. Uh, play was center. I saw collaboration. I saw, um, 
just so much joy uh, in the students, and I saw every single teacher, um, staff member there smiling. Um, they were so warm and welcome, mm -hmm. and I am attending on the 18th. They have a policy committee, and um, the parents are involved, um, so I, I also appreciate that the parents are active and have a voice in their child's education, um, so I'm really excited about that. And um, I can't, I can't wait. They said that I can come back as many times as I want to. And I'm like, I am holding you to that. <laughs> I'm coming. Um, Cause I sure love to play. Uh, two other things that I want to mention. Um, number one, uh, I think uh, many of you saw the patch article that came out today um, regarding uh, Tony Allegro's class uh, community action learning and the important work that they're doing. Um, I was astonished that that was happening um, and how empowering it was for the students. Um, they had an opportunity to engage in the research process for nonprofit management, um, create a, a proposal, um, and then not only just create that proposal, but follow it through. Um, and what an opportunity for the students of Enfield. And I want to, um, you know, Mr. Allegro, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Superintendent, Assistant, Assistant Superintendent, for um, giving space for such experiential learning, um, and also to the students. Um, that is a bold step forward. Um, as somebody um, at our university, we have a graduate degree in nonprofit management, and maybe those students are now going to feel a little bit more comfortable um, towing forward in some of these advanced degrees because they've had such a powerful experience at Enfield High. Um, I was also really thrilled to hear about uh, the amount of AP courses that are offered at the high school level. Um, Accessibility is really important to me, and the more opportunities that we give our students to have college credits, um, the more accessible college is to them, if that is their chosen um, route. I mean, we all, um, I, I, my, I got my start in community college. Um, my uh, financial aid and um, my, uh, my student loan load right now is a third of what many of my uh, cohort is because I started uh, and had a rigorous education with community colleges. Um, and so that we are making it accessible, um, I consider it social justice. We are, we are giving people opportunities to engage in a uh, college education, um, earn college credits, and while we're supporting them here in Enfield. Um, so I'm thrilled to hear that. Um, if that is the path that they want to take, I want to also say that um, so many of our students here in Enfield go on to trades, they go on to service in the military, they have entrepreneurial pursuits. Um, you know, clearly, we are preparing our students for many wonderful things. Um, and that starts at Head Start <laughs> and continues all the way through Enfield High. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Ms. Ms. LeBlanc. Yep. Um, I uh, was able to attend the eighth grade band concert on December 20th. And what a difference a year makes, doesn't it? Isn't it incredible? They were awesome. And the band is a little smaller now, huh? Is it, are they? <laughs> um, and I just, they, they just even look that much older and more confident. It was such an enjoyable um, concert. I, w I was happy to attend. Um, JFK's PTO meeting was canceled this month uh, because of the boiler issue. Um, so I'm just going to kind of reiterate JFK is selling their winter hats with the new Patriot logo for $20. Um, and I think we were saying it would be great if all nine of us could purchase a hat. Um, since we're usually sporting like the Enfield high colors will you know support red white and blue um and that um they're still having their purse bingo on february 3rd um anybody that's interested in tickets for that or a hat can um, email jfk middle school pto gmail .com. so um i think that's all i have for everyone thank you thank you to Ms. leblanc anyone else that's okay no. go ahead go for it go ahead mr neville Okay, uh, first of all, Happy New Year. It's hard to believe that we're already through the holidays. Uh, and we're also through the cold. I didn't even need my uh, heavy jacket today to come out tonight. Um, a couple of things. One, uh, that just picking up on your Head Start thing, they're wonderful over there, aren't they? And they welcome you in there, and the kids are great. They usually invite us all in there 
around Dr. Seuss's birthday to read. If you could let it, I always forget when that is, okay? But if you could let us all know, I love going into the read, although the chairs are very uncomfortable for me. <laughs> okay, you too. <laughs> but uh, I'd love to go in there. If you could let us all know. Um, secondly, hats, like you did with the shirts, uh, Tina, if you would kind of yeah. shepherd oh, that, sure, just absolutely. let us know. I'll be happy to, to yeah. join in on that. I committed us all anyway. <laughs> I kind of figured that. <laughs> so in other words, fork over 20 bucks, everybody. Perfect. Sounds Thank great. You. Okay. Uh, that, that's a liaison for Kite, but we had a meeting, uh, and my wife went to the meeting. Uh, we, we had a leadership meeting that night. Um, but they are, they, we've invited them to come in, and I think they, I, hopefully they have arranged it with you for the 23rd, is it, our, our next meeting, to come in and give us an update on that. I, I think it's Leanne, and I think it's uh, Chris Gummo, is it? Okay, they'll be coming in. So um, I'll be going to the next meeting, but uh, they should be here at the next meeting. I'm picking up on Tony Allegro. He's homegrown talent. Uh, he's a great kid. His family's great. Uh, and uh, he does wonderful things in the classroom. He got his start, I think, at JFK, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Sigolsky. So you guys did a good job with him, but I think he's at the high school now. But he does a great job. And I think we've always felt that we need to highlight the good people that, that we have here and the things that they're doing. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. People don't know what goes on out there. We have so many wonderful things that go on, and we just don't uh, deal with it the way I think we should. Um, one other thing in terms of... Um, I, I, was, I was thinking of uh, writing down some things to say. I forgot that we had a holidays in the middle, and we all went to Rachel's Challenge. I know a number of you were there, okay? It was a wonderful time. I've been there the last, I think every year that they've had that breakfast. Every year it gets a little bit bigger, and, and this place, this time it was packed, okay? Mr. Sigolsky was cooking uh, uh, pancakes in the, in the back room and with his, his crew there, but uh, it was packed. Santa Claus was there, and kids were there, families were there. It's just, it was just super, and um, I think, you know, I, you know, and I'm reflecting on it, I just say, you know, what a tribute it is that all of our kids and their parents and the kids come out for this, and it just gets bigger and better all the time. It certainly is kind of a true spirit of the holidays that they come out and do that. And it's like events like that just make me so proud to be a citizen here. It really is. It's a big town, but a small town, and that small town type of experience that they have there, it was just fabulous. So I, I applaud you guys, and I encourage you to keep doing it. And, and the pancakes were good, too. <laughs> big ones. Anyway, with that said, have a good year, everyone. Mr. Mr. Radier. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to um, bring the warm greetings of the Hazardville Huskies <laughs> and the great PTO over there. Um, they had a uh, wonderful PTO meeting last week, and um, they really, Miss um, Hunter put on a presentation to kind of uh, explain what PBIS is for the parents. and. Um, She's not only doing that, but she's saying it's to the next step, and she's holding coffee with the principal um, where parents can come in and actually have a one-to-one -one conversation with her and talk to her about uh, PBIS and any questions or concerns they may have. Uh, so she definitely opened up that door to the parents of the Hazardville community, and that was uh, greatly appreciated. Um, they also just had an assembly uh, the other day where they uh, – had a Christmas holiday sing-along, uh, where separated by grades, so kindergarten, first and second, and uh, parents had a chance to come in and see the the kiddos perform. Uh, the PTO had uh, set something up, at Barnes and Noble, uh, but big, big, big class, small, small, small space. Uh, so not every parent got to see their kid perform, even if they were there. Uh, so Miss Hunter. Uh, and her staff uh, opened up the gymnasium and, and let parents in, and uh, it was a great event uh, by everyone. So uh, they're very busy over there. Uh, they're active, and uh, it was great to see so many smiles on everyone's faces. So just wanted to uh, give big kudos to the Hazardville family. So thank you. Miss Riley. Mm. Okay, so I wanted to first ask through the chairman to the superintendent. Um, I was just wondering how Power School went for progress reports for JFK, if everything was good. If you recall, they were, they were ready to go. The, the promise date was the 15th, but there was a couple of kinks, so they sent them out on the following Monday. And as far as I know, everything went out went without a hitch. Great. Thank you. Um, along the line of Rachel's uh, challenge, wreaths across America also happened 
in our long break. And that was the first time I've ever gone, and it was amazing. There was all the kids out there, all the community members, and like the moving tributes that they gave. It was incredible. I had a great time. Um, I wanted to say First Readers is having their annual um, fundraiser, Trivia Night. It's on Saturday, February 24th at 7 p.m. So you could check out uh, the Facebook page or their website, and they're selling tickets on there um, on both through Eventbrite. Um, and their next recognition ceremony is on March 5th at Enfield High. So hopefully we'll be certifying a bunch of new readers then. That's always a good time. Um, don't forget, tomorrow's a half day. I know that the robocall already went out, but I figured I'd say it again. <laughs> um, and I went to the Henry Barnard PTO this evening before I came here. Um, the food shelf boat is there now, and they're working on filling it up, so that's great. Uh, they are also having a Chipotle fundraiser night on February 8th, so if anybody wants to come help raise some funds for Henry Barnard, that would be incredible. And I just wanted to wish their secretary uh, the best um, in her new future endeavors. Um, she was an absolutely wonderful secretary, and uh, we're all going to miss her. Um, and that's all I have. Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you, Miss Riley. You stole my thunder of just about everything. So <laughs> typical that I. Anyone else want to speak before I go? No, go ahead, Miss Mr. Poe. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I only have a couple really quick comments. Um, first, I have a question to the superintendent through the chair. Um, I had heard concerns regarding heating in other schools other than JFK. I did not receive any reports that there were any issues with any of the heating systems in any other school, so I was just hoping you could confirm that. Did you camera to answer that? I, I didn't hear anything either. I mean, it... No, there was one. Uh, we did in light of everything that happened we reached out to every school just to confirm that there weren't individual heating issues in any of the schools um, there were occasional um, hiccups on the first day back um, there was one classroom over at uh, prudence crandall um, that the heat was the temperature not got never got below 60 but that was the coldest spot in the building uh, Principal Miller offered the teacher to go into an op a vacant room that she had. Uh, to be honest, I'm not quite sure if she even took her up on it um, because the teacher said, I th at one, initially, no, I think we're okay. Um, there was another issue that it wasn't a boiler issue. It was a particular issue with a blower in one of the classrooms that was cold for a particular day. Um, the teacher was given the opportunity to move. The kids actually overruled and said, no, we just want to put our coats on. We're having fun. Um, and those are the only two issues that were standalone. And quite honestly, if we weren't dealing with the JFK issue, I probably wouldn't have heard about them because um, they usually handle them within their own buildings, particularly, like I said, the first day back after winter recess. But we did reach out to all the schools just to confirm we weren't having any widespread heating issues. So those are the two that I can report back. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that anyone who might have had any concerns about any other school other than JFK is assured that everything was okay. Um, other than that, it's a little bit quiet. I did attend the ESS uh, PTO meeting and Field Street School. Um, lots of brainstorming for great fundraiser ideas um, going on. There's definitely going to be more to follow as we firm up a couple more items that will be coming up um, in the near future. Um, basically, all, the, all through the spring, February through May, there will be some exciting things. Um, so hopefully next meeting I can share a little bit more of that with you. Um, one thing I did want to comment on, we spent a lot of time at that PTO meeting discussing um, the achievements of the PTO and the achievements of their fundraising efforts and the things that those fundraising efforts actually do for the students in the school. Um, you know, I've always been the kind of parent who, of course, sure, you know, I'll participate in whatever the PTO activity is or the fundraiser, but it's very different when you're on the other side and you're actually seeing what is getting paid for, um, you know, through, through these efforts. You know, anything from field trips, um, extra items and activities in the classroom, um, no cost activities for students and their families. Um, it's really, it's really a beautiful thing. Um, so my message mostly is, please stay tuned for Enfield Street specific items, but support 
those PTOs. You know, if there's anything that's giving you a hang up or you're not sure or, you know, you don't know if you can swing it, you know, these kids really, it's amazing how much extra they get um, over the course of, of the school year because of those efforts. Um, so I want to say thank you on behalf of the Enfield Street PTO to everyone who's contributed to that and also again encourage everyone to continue supporting those events and activities. The kids love them. They get the biggest kick out of some of these activities um, and it really means a lot. Um, so to thank you and hopefully we'll continue to see a lot of support. Thank you, Mr. Fogel. So anyone else again? No? Okay, so uh, this past Saturday, Buzz Robotics got their video and they're up and going, gonna be working now for the next, I think six weeks to get their robot built. So they got their marching orders from the First, first Robotics, I believe it is, or whoever the organization is. And uh, and they're in the design phase now, so so look out. They'll be here showing it to us sooner than later and, and going to their, trying to attend some of their uh, events. Uh, you mentioned Wreath Across America, Rachel's Challenge. I, I helped out there. I was in charge of quality control. As pancakes went out, I sampled them. So... so. So, so the quality was spot on. <laughs> Inspector 12, checked them all. They were all good. So. Um, and, uh, and that's about it. And, you know, it's, it's said that I was, I was said somewhere that we don't care. Well, I think we do all care up here. You know, we give our time. We come to these meetings. And, and it shows. And, and, you know, and we do announce what, what's what we do we try to go to other meetings to see what's going on you know we attend things and so we care that's what i'm just trying to say is and and, and i i read it somewhere i don't know where it was that you know that we don't care well that's not true i get another another fake news we do care we hear you know there's all nine of us are here tonight said and ask any of one what are we getting paid for this zero okay so that's all I have to say because I'll continue and I'll say something wrong. So let's leave it at that. So number 10, unfinished business, we have none. So number 11, now do we want to add to the agenda now? Yeah. All right, so why don't we make, a, we need a, a motion to suspend the rules and add an item to our new, new business. So we'll call it 11E. So moved. Okay. And we're adding second. on a first and second reading if that's okay, or do we want to just do a first reading for this new policy? Well, we can have a second reading next time and just do it uh, and vote on it next time, right? It's, it, it, I'm leaving it to you guys. You I, I, I just think it's, a, it's better to have the two readings over two meetings. Okay, I think. As that's long fine. as it's not going to you know, short-circuit anything that we no, don't have if, to do. If we're, we're, if we're good with that, so we're going to add it to the, to the agenda that we're going to have a first reading of, and what's the policy, Mr. Rainier? Uh, so what we'll be adding to the agenda this evening for a first reading would be uh, policy 6111 uh, in regards to school calendars. Uh, this policy came up when we, uh, the superintendent was looking at the uh, calendar, uh, and it became known that in item 7 of the school calendar policy, uh, the original policy read, the graduation dates for the senior class will be fixed to the 185th and 186th days for the two high schools within the adopted calendar and are required to take place prior to uh, July 1st of each year. Graduations must occur on weekend, uh, weekdays, Monday point, through Friday. Point of information, we haven't voted on adding. No, no, I know. He's just uh, he's making it part existing. of the reading the motion. I'm reading we, what we're, we're not adding. voting yet. Are you going to roll it? No. He, he's, just, he's, just, he's just reading it to, to the record, and, and then I'll, I'll add your so moved, and then we'll ask for a second. So. Right. Okay. Uh, the two high schools will annually rotate graduation dates between the fixed 185 and 186 days. Uh, as we know, we no longer have two high schools. Uh, so the uh, amended policy uh, ran through the policy committee uh, and was unanimous in regards to changing it to the following. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion on the so, following. So, no, he, it was so moved by Mr. Yeah. Neville, will second by Mr. Radier. So, uh, the, so this is a vote to add it to the agenda. To add to the agenda the new it, the, the new, new policy in its reading, which would be the graduation dates for the senior class will be fixed to the 185th days within the adopted calendar and is required to take place prior to July 1st of each year. Graduation okay. must occur. Okay. We you don't need to do that. We just need to add it to the agenda at this point. Okay. Is it a roll call vote or by hand? 
um, we should do roll call. We okay. need two thirds, right? Yeah. yeah. Two -thirds. So, so roll call vote, please. Mrs. Depoe? Yes. Mrs. Hernandez? Yes. Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Mr. Neville? Yes. Mr. Renier? Yes. Mrs. Riley? Yes. Mr. Rutledge? Yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Chairman Cruzel? Yes. Motion passes. So that's adding it to the agenda. So back up to 11A. Let's go through this and we'll we'll bring it up at the end of in a new business. So 11A, Mr. Dresick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a, some of you may know, some of you may not know, our current agreement with um, Smith, Smith Bus Company to provide transportation for the Enfield Public Schools expires on June 30th of this school year. Uh, we typically will go in a multi-year contract with Smith Bus, um, but because there were some ownership changes and some of that question was in limbo last year at this time, uh, we reached out to the representative for Smith Bus at the time, um, which was through an estate attorney, and did a one-year extension. Um, and in return, Smith Bus gave us a 0% increase for the current school year that we're in. Um, about two weeks ago, I was notified officially that Bob Smith, who was Dick Smith's brother, had purchased the company officially um, from the estate or however the matters were related and had an opportunity to go over and talk to Mr. Smith. Um, finally, we weren't able to do that prior to it becoming official. Uh, so now Bob Smith, Mr. Smith's brother, now owns Smith, Gump, Smith Bus Company. Um, we have three options when it comes to a transportation contract. One is if we do a multi-year agreement like we typically would do, last year was atypical, um, the Board of Ed can't engage in a multi-year contract without permission of the town council. So we would have to go out and do a formal bid. You do a bid process, and then after that, you award the contract based upon what the bid results are going to be. Uh, another option, which is more common for the Board of Ed, um, is they would approach, because we had such a good relationship with Mr. Smith, that we would approach the town council and ask for what's called a bid waiver and just exclusively negotiate with Smith Bus Company. As long as the council approves that, you have the ability to enter into a multi-year agreement with the council's permission. The last option, because in what we did last year, um, is the board does have the right to enter into a one-year agreement or contract extension because it doesn't violate the charter by going into multiple years. Uh, Mr. Smith reached out to me during our conversation and indicated that because he's just taking over the company essentially a week and a half ago, um, and his intention is to run the business the same way that his brother did. Um, his intention is to keep the employees that they currently have there now, or Mr. Smith, the former Mr. Smith treated like family. His intention is to continue to do that. And it asks that if the board is interested in continuing the relationship on a one-year basis so that everybody can get their feet wet and get to know each other with the new players, he would certainly entertain the idea of another one-year contract extension and honor the 0% increase going in for next year. So at this point, I would ask the board, if you are interested, that the board would need to give me authorization to enter into a one-year contract extension with Smith Bus. Um, and that's the, mo that's the action I would need the board to take, giving me the authorization to do that. Could I just ask a question? Where did this name come from that's on the agenda? Is that the, na the new name of the company? Perspective no. Supply Company? Is that what you're talking about? Perspective Supply. Okay. Because, because I, didn't re I didn't reveal what the company was until just now. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> just checking that yeah. we're No, that's not the right name. It's Smith. It is still, the, the name has not changed. It is still Smith, Com Smith Bus oh. Company. Okay. 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 Um, okay. They so. haven't changed it to Perspective Supply okay. Company. On the side of the bus. Perspective okay. Supply. Okay. All right. so I'm sure they'll get a chuckle out of that when I when I reach back out to them at the end of the week. Can we start with a motion so, to get so, Yes, so we need a motion to extend we'll, the contract. So moved by Mr. Neville, seconded by Ms. Riley. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? So we are extending their contract for one year at no additional cost. I, I think our history, see I'm old, and I've been through three or four bus companies. Our history with the Smith Bus Company has been just superb. And if he makes a commitment that he's going to do it, and he's doing it at 0% here, and, and we're extending we extending it at that rate? Yes. The same rate? Extending the, exact, the existing contract we have. We're just changing the dates. I would, I, 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 I trust this man to the hilt, and I, I'd certainly highly recommend it. I do, it. too. Yeah. Staying in the family, so. Any other discussion? Kathy, roll call, please. Mrs. DePoe? Yes. Mrs. Hernandez? Yes. Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Mr. Neville? Yes. Mr. Renier? Yes. Mrs. Riley? Yes. Mr. Rutledge? Yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Chairman Cruzel? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. 11B? Yes. Fiscal year 2018-2019 budget presentation. Chris, Mike? Oh, you have one there. Okay. Okay. 
everyone change your minders. <laughs> There you go. Good. We're watching Mr. Barassa. I got it all set. <laughs> yeah, he, he's not happy. He's not happy. He's got a game. He's been texting me all throughout the evening. Okay. So are you okay with me standing because I'm too uh, antsy you, to sit down? And you can do whatever you wish. Okay. So, well, you're going to have to suffer. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So in the essence of time, I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as I can um, because I know you have other things on the agenda, the other agenda to get to. Um, I asked my friends at ETV if they can't hear me to stick their heads out. I can see them. And if I don't see them, I'm going to keep going. So I got the thumbs up. Here we go. So what you see in front of you is where I'm going to start. And I'm actually glad that it was unrehearsed that some of you had mentioned it during your board member comments today that what you see in front of you is not just our district's logo, but what's our district's motto. And that wasn't something that I created. That wasn't something that Andy and I sat in a room in the summer and said, and you've all heard this before, but for the benefit of those at home who may have not heard this story before, I'll give you the abridged version. When I first take took over as superintendent, one of the concerns I had was I wanted to hear from what our own people thought we did. We get and too much in our, our line of work. We get wrapped up in the things that we have to do in the what that we do, we always lose sight as to the why we do things. So we put it out there. We put it out to our administrators first, and we came up with just in, in 10 words or less, tell me what we do, what we believe in. That's what we came up with. But we couldn't stop there. At Convocation, I introduced this to the entire staff of, of, the, of everyone who worked for the Enfield Public Schools, and I threw it out. I said, this isn't mine. Tell me if we got it right. Tell me if you don't like it. Tell me if it's something that you don't believe in. Can you put your name on that statement? It says simply, we make a difference in Enfield every child every day. We had an over-under that the responses that I would get, I sent it out in an email and asked for people's feedback, and there was nothing on the email except that. And the over-under was I'd get 50 responses. And I'm going to be honest, I took the under, because a lot of times I just assumed people weren't going to respond to me on this stuff. Well, well over 300 responses later, I've heard people's personal stories. I've heard people's not just personal stories on why they got into this line of work, but I heard stories like what Mr. Grisell said earlier about why you're doing this. It's because you care. Nobody got into this, regardless of what people might think, for the money, whether it's you as volunteers or employees who work for us. People didn't grow up dreaming to be a teacher, dreaming to be an administrator because they thought they were going to get rich. They did it because they wanted to make a difference in a kid's life, just like a lot of us had teachers that made the difference for us. You're going to hear a lot of this, and I'm going to warn you in advance because – this is something that has taken on a life of its own and we really believe. So whether you're sick of it or not, I got the microphone, you got to listen. <laughs> but what, what just happened here? Uh-oh. Guy's going to kill me. This was working earlier. No, why is it not working? On this one, yeah. Side to side. Okay, one more try. Yeah, it's not. Oh, here we go. It keeps resetting. Now he's really going to kill me. This one? No. Okay, this doesn't work. I'm doing it by hand. I know, right? Well, it's a good thing. Let's see if this works. Does that work? Oh, that's what this one yeah, is. this isn't it. This didn't go like this in rehearsals. Would you like Mr. Ryder, though? Maybe take a look at it. <laughs> Mr. Ryder here. <laughs> He's really like. 
Why is it not? Went right to the end. That's all. Oops. Did you see that? Look the other way. I think that's going to do it. Now. Okay. Mr. Brass, I fixed it on my own. Okay. Sorry about that. So here we go. Before I tell you what we need for a spending plan for next year, the important thing is that I take you through what we did with the money we got last year and what our accomplishments are. Now, in fairness to all of our administrative staff and all of our building administrators and department administrators, we've asked them all to share their accomplishments in their buildings. We also, in the essence of time, asked everyone to try to narrow that down to three things I can share with you. As I'm rehearsing this, when it actually worked the first two times I tried it, um, one of the things I noticed that as I went through, particularly in our elementary schools, we try to diversify some of their accomplishments because they do do so many things together that as we switch some of the things up, some buildings had different priorities, but that doesn't mean they didn't accomplish some of the same things in their own schools. So what I'm going to do as we go through this is I'm not going to read every single one. I'm just going to give you a couple of highlights from each, and you all have that, the presentation in your packet. We can, I can certainly ask, answer questions about it, but in the essence of time, I'll try to do uh, one or two per slide as I can. So at Enfield High School, the first glaring thing is we're still talking about last school year for what our accomplishments were. And the biggest accomplishment we had was we successfully consolidated two high schools into one. That was our very first year of the new Enfield High School. Along with the very first year of new Enfield High School was the first year of our new block schedule with the creation of Eagle Hour. There were increased opportunities for students to explore their interests through the flexibility of an Eagle Block period. Uh, students no longer had access to study halls like they've had in years past. There's also the development of new programs at Enfield High School, such as the Career Counseling Program, which had 60 new partnerships, 145 job shadow experiences, eight career education field trips, and 200 career education classroom visits. You've also heard about Wednesday night school. The implementation of that started at Enfield High School. Um, you've had the, the folks who started that program actually come present to the board, but that was an accomplishment that was, a, that was achieved through Enfield High School. Mr. Solgowski's left, so we're going to skip over JFK. Kidding. At JFK, some of the accomplishments, some of you were on the board at the time where they went through their NEASC accreditation visit. That took up a large chunk of resources and time, but I can say that JFK not only passed, but they're, now an they're still an accredited middle school. Uh, they implemented a new social theater arts program that paired special education students with regular education peers. And a lot of the works that students did with, with philanthropic efforts that go beyond the community involved. Prudence Crandall. Prudence Crandall was our pilot for PBIS. Before we initiated it district-wide, Prudence Crandall was the one school that we implemented as a pilot. And to give you a little bit of an example of whether or not it's working, you could look at some of the figures that Prudence Crandall was able to share for us through the Swiss database that I shared with you a few weeks ago, is that their tier one increased from 83 to 87%, but more importantly, their tier two interventions increased from 15% to 54%. I don't want to focus all that. There's also some great academic data that are coming out of our buildings, uh, particularly in reading, where the increased percentage of students in grades scoring goal or higher on the DRP went from 43.9% to 46 percent. At Parkman, Parkman obviously supports several charitable events and you stole my thunder with the Reads Across America that a lot of you had the opportunity to take part in, um, but that's one of the things we wanted to make sure that we highlighted that Parkman has been a perennial favorite of the Reads Across America program coming. And when, to, to highlight some of the academic data that happened at, at Parkman <clears throat> over last school year, Students who scored three plus on the ELA was 56%, which is above the state average, and math at 57%, which was at the state average. Eli Whitney in reading, which we measured by the, the district DRP, Eli Whitney School made significant increases in the median and average score for the whole school. They also had significant increases in grade four math and grade five math. Eli Whitney, along with all of our schools, also participated in the One Book, One School program, where students read Edgar Allen's official crime investigation notebook by Mary Amato. 
Henry Barnard. Henry Barnard implemented the STEAM initiatives in all classrooms and grades K to two, but every school did. But one of the things that we wanted, like I said, we wanted to diversify some of the achievements that each school did. That was one thing that jumped out on the Henry Barnard page. Uh, in addition to that, participating in One Book, One School, and really fostering a community outreach through mentoring, programs like First Readers, and another program you may not be familiar with, which is called Truck Buddies, which you're going to hear about, not at this meeting, but another time where we partner with actual truckers who come in and do reading events for the kids in the school. Enfield Street School. Enfield Street hosted, we mentioned Rachel's Challenge earlier in the night. We also have a part of the component of the Rachel's Challenge program where Rachel's Challenge high school kids come in and volunteer, and they volunteer with kids in grade two at, at Enfield Street School. They also volunteer on a daily basis, and many of the Lego volunteers that go to all three grade levels at, at Enfield Street School. 100% of grade two students showed a year's growth or more on the math performance test last year at Enfield Street School. Hazardville Memorial. Hazardville also expanded their school-wide PBIS system to meet the social-emotional needs of students as a vehicle to increase academic readiness. They also continued professional development for our teachers and writers, uh, writing workshops through Teachers College. And they also made a significant effort to increase family involvement and participation through their academic parent-teacher team pilot program, which we're looking at doing at other schools, and I could see Mr. Ryder already getting excited. Stowe Early Learning Center. Those of you familiar with Stowe, this is where our coordinator likes to refer to our students there as our tiny humans. Um, our Stowe Early Learning Center continued our collaboration amongst the EPS STEAM Academy, uh, the Family Resource Center, which is housed at, at, at the Stowe Early Learning Center, the Enfield Child Development Center, and the Enfield Integrated Preschool, all of which are all housed at the, at the Stowe Early Learning Center. Um, the, uh, the So Early Learning Center, the Pre-K STEAM Academy also went through their own accreditation process where they had a, vid a visit as well as putting their portfolios together for their candidacy. We also expanded. We went from two classrooms to three classrooms in the Pre-K STEAM Academy. Computer technology. The computer technology curriculum this year was actually expanded. In years past, students in kindergarten and grade one didn't get computer ed. All students in grades K through 12 now get computer or technology. In the essence of time, I, this is where I'll give you one. I'll give you one in computer technology, not to minimize it, because this was, this was another big one that I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on. Some of you were on the board when we actually initiated this process. And one of the things that we talked about about two years ago was we built this great state-of-the-art high school with a wing dedicated to STEAM. It's actually in the name of the Enrico Fermi STEAM Wing at Enfield High School. We opened up a building called the Stowe Early Learning Center with a pre-K STEAM themed preschool program. We've initiated a bunch of programs at JFK that are geared toward STEAM and robotics education. We woke up one morning and realized we're missing a chunk of kids. But by the time we realized it, it was already October. So we went to our curriculum staff and said, let's just say hypothetically, we can come up with the funding or the resources to implement something mid-year. Could we do it? And what would you need? So our curriculum staff basically dropped what they were doing for about a month and came back to Dr. Schumann and I and said, this is what we would need. It's kind of a hard task to do implement in the middle of a year, but we think we can pull it off. We are also in a position where the amount of teachers that we needed to do this we had had some vacancies we weren't anticipating from the previous year. So we pulled the trigger and we implemented it midway through the year, and therefore every child in the Enfield Public Schools from pre-K to 12 is involved in some sort of STEAM education. That was a big deal, not just for us, but it's also a big deal for every student that goes through the system has some sort of exposure to a STEAM-related education. Our guidance department, one of the big things that we talk about, the successful consolidation of the two high schools, um, you can't leave out the guidance department who was run a little ragged during that time with kids coming over from a new high school, coming over to, to live at Enfield High, and not just merging the departments, but people coming to a new place that they had to live, and also try to get the kids on board that are coming to a new high school. So I know our guidance department went above and beyond with the merger of Fermi and Enfield High School uh, to lead the review and reflection practices that they were working on. Um, but the kinds department is also K-12, and there's a lot of activities and events that some of you I've seen you at um, that are actually led and, and 
directed by our guidance department, such as our college fair, our financial aid seminar, which we just had one last week, I believe. I'm losing my days because of the storm. Um, the program of studies nights, junior planning for college and career readiness. One of the things that our guidance department has also taken on with the consolidation of our elementary schools is putting an effort on linking our elementary schools to our middle schools and helping that transition for kids between the primary, the intermediate, the middle school and the high school process be a lot smoother for kids and for families. Sure. The Career Counseling Center. Yeah, we'll get there. Okay. Different department. Everybody's stealing my, you know how long I planned this? You just took it all away. All right. I feel like Walter. Um, library services. Uh, I know. Uh, the library services. One thing I want to point out about our library services, which is a K-12 department. But one of the things that they continuously do is the connection with the Enfield Public Library. And anyone who either has a third grader, who's ever had a third grader, or knows of a third grader, knows that one thing that our third graders look forward to every year is they get the trip to the library to get their library card. That is coordinated not only with the Enfield Public Library, but also with the Enfield Public Schools Library Services. And that continued. Music. I could probably take the rest of your evening talking about music accomplishments, so I promised Dr. Goodnight I would just pick out the good stuff and talk and, and let the, the, the reputation of the music department do itself. Anyone who's been to a town event, whether it be a parade, a festival, any kind of town celebration, and you've heard instruments being played or, or, or students singing, in all likelihood, that's an Enfield Public Schools music student. Um, there's performances throughout the community, throughout the state, including their, their growing number of achievements on the state and, in some cases, national level um, for competitions. Another, another accomplishment for the music department is they, last year they started a Tri-M chapter at Enfield High School, which is an international music honor society. I wanted to make sure I got that in because I believe one of your board representatives is actually in that. I won't tell you who. Physical education and health, K-12. One thing that shouldn't come as a surprise to you, and the reason it's the first one is because we brought not only this group to you, but we also brought this group to the town council because we're extremely proud of them, and that's our unified sports program, which falls under physical education. Unified sports was named a national champion banner school by the Special Olympics of America. We're also very proud of our ETLA program, and they have a partnership with Springfield College where our infield students go up to Springfield College and part participate in physical activities. Continuing with PE, somebody asked this question last year, so I wanted to make it a point. And so why does PE looking for technology? I think the picture on the top will show you. We actually funded five iPads for the PE department, and it gave kids and teachers an opportunity to see real-time data on the things they were working on in their class. Um, wanted to make sure that we, we also highlighted the number of collaborative partnerships that our PE department is with with things like the, Net, the Network Against Domestic Abuse, Enfield Police Department, the Enfield Together Coalition, and the North Central Opioid Addiction Network. Reading Department, and this is another K-12 department. Uh, one of the things our reading department was, was charged with, not just with the libraries, but increasing the quantity of the diverse books that we have. So they've utilized a variety of award-winning and professionally recommended book lists to make sure that our classroom libraries and the best they could, our building level libraries are stocked with appropriate materials for our kids and for our teachers. Special education. Special education, which covers pre-K to 12, exceeded the state target for the percentage of preschool children who were functioning within age expectations by the time they exited the program. That's a pretty big deal. The other big deal is 100% of our grade 12 students last year that received social work services graduated from Enfield High School. And it keeps going back to remem remembering why we're doing this, to get those kids to walk across that stage. Visual arts. I can list all the different events where you'll see kids' artworks um, displayed throughout town. I know we're talking about doing some different things this year, um, but our visual arts department is K-12. The visual arts department has participated in numerous community events. Most glowingly is our annual arts show which is this year was held at Enfield High School. And you'll know it's on display over a weekend. It's in partner with the, the, the Women's 
I, mean, I don't want to say the wrong one, the Women's Club of Enfield who sponsors it. Um, but any, if you get the opportunity in the spring to go through the art show, you'll be blown away about the, the, the level of talent that our kids have in this district, especially when it comes to the visual arts. And if you don't believe me, and next time you're over in my office, look around because Mr. Fay, he finally brought some artwork into Andy and I's office to put on display just how talented our kids were. And as a side note, I saw Mr. Fahey in my office today that I didn't know he was there taking something off the wall. And I asked, why are you there, Mr. Fahey? We're supposed to be downstairs in a meeting. And he said, I need to take this piece of artwork down because it was nominated for a state level award and won and is now going to be displayed down in Hartford. So this just reiterates the, the quality of work that our kids are doing. In addition to the quality of work they're doing, uh, we had 11 students graduate last year and are enrolled in visual arts at the college level through our portfolio classes. We've also implemented new coursework at the new high school, including AP Art History. Athletics is another one that we can talk a lot about um, because there's so much and so vast, but athletics, people forget, is 6 to 12. We have competitive athletics at JFK as well. We can list the teams and all the accomplishments. We can also list the individuals and all the accomplishments, but I want to take particular notice to the picture um, that those of you may recognize what this is, but was, uh, earlier in the fall, we actually had our first national signing day at Enfield High School, where we had four um, Enfield High seniors who had signed letters of intent to play Division I athletics at next year as their freshman year in college. Um, I also want to highlight that not only was this an event that was um, created, um, that was supported by the athletic department and our athletic director, Mr. O'Connell. But if you notice the signs that the students are holding in, holding in their hands that actually say their names and the universities they're planning on attending, that was actually created by our graphic arts department. The picture doesn't do it justice. I thought they bought them. So when I walked through, I said, where did you get the signs out? They're pretty cool. And then Mr. Petrucci turned around and said, I made them. So again, highlighting and integrating all of our departments into one. But the biggest thing I want to highlight about our athletic department is not the accomplishments that our kids have on the field or on the court. So, t so many times that will get lost when we're talking about athletics, about whether a team wins or loses or a student has an individual accomplishment. What sometimes gets lost is the amount of community service that our athletic programs in, uh, engage in. Our Enfield girls back basketball team got a community service proclamation from the town of Enfield. On a weekly basis, I'm getting an update from a coach saying that one of our teams were volunteering at at places like Enfield Lowe's and Fishes, Enfield Girls Soccer Association, the Knights of Columbus, Special Olympics, and Thompsonville Little League. Anytime you drive around town, you're going to most likely going to see kids wearing some sort of Enfield High School athletic uniform, whether it's doing some sort of fundraising or doing some sort of community service project. To me, no matter how many accolades we may get for our performance on and off the court, this is the part that I'm most proud of. Our business department. We're getting there, Ms. LeBlanc. Um, any, speaking of you, kids running around town wearing something that says Enfield High School on it, in all likelihood they got it from the school store. Uh, the school store was staff, uh, the school store staff developed a business plan and they actually earned the DECA school based enterprise gold certification status. That's a long name for award, but the short answer is only one of two teams in Connecticut actually reached that level of status and only one of Three, one of 183 teams in the United States that day. We also had nine marketing students that qualified for the International Career Development Conference uh, in Anaheim, California. And the business department also works directly with us, Nuntuck Community College, to increase enrollment in our College Connections program. What also falls under the business department is our, car our, our career counselors, who, as I said earlier, have developed over 20 different career exploration exploration visitation opportunities. They've had five guest speaker programs that come in on, for different panels. They began the Career Training Expo that was composed of over 20 representatives from various careers and training program. And these two women are everywhere. Uh, and the next place they're probably going to be, our agenda is booked in January, but I mentioned to them in the summer that I need them to come in front of the board and say all the great things that they do because no one can articulate it as well as them. And they've actually been asking me when they can come. So you will get more information on our career counseling program uh, coming in the further months. Our English department. Our, one thing that was really interesting over last school year was that the English department designed and staffed a high school writing center 
with trained student tutors that were available to assist through the appointment, through appointments and during the Eagle Block. So these were actually kids helping out other kids that were trained by teachers and staff members to help other kids during their free time during Eagle Hour uh, in the area of writing. We also added new course offerings to the program of studies. We have honors advanced placement composition and the American experience. And then we also achieved higher than, higher than the national average on both AP literature and composition as well as AP language and composition exams. Family and consumer science. 89% of our early childhood education, career and technical education concentrators exceeded the goal score on the CTE assessment. Our advanced culinary arts students catered various events throughout the school year. So if you happened to be at convocation this year and there was a breakfast before the convocation started, you would have noticed that the food that was prepared was not bought from an outside agency. That was prepared by Enfield High School students. And one of the coolest things was finally getting them uniforms like every other athletic or competitive team that has the Enfield High logo on it and having all the kids come down in front of the entire faculty and staff of the Enfield Public Schools with their uniform. Those kids were more proud to have a uniform than a lot of athletic teams are. Mathematics. We actually had two high school students last year receive the RTI Computing Medal Award. Both students will receive a scholarship value at $28,000 a piece to attend uh, RTI. Our AP Stats class was added to the Enfield High Program of Studies and also offered three sections of AP Stats. Science. As a result of the Eagle Block schedule and new electives, more students are enrolled in science courses than ever. I hope so because we've put a district-wide initiative into our STEAM program and we're now starting to see the fruits of that labor. 142 students took an AP science exam and earned up to eight college credits as part of our, part of our UConn Early College Experience program. We initiated a marine biology program, and if you take a look at the top picture, the gentleman in the suit might look familiar. That's Dr. Henry Lee. And some of our kids were able to take a trip down to the Henry Lee Forensic Science Center at the University of New Haven and actually had the opportunity through our forensic science course to meet Dr. Lee. Social studies. Enfield High School last year was recognized as the outstanding high school program in the inaugural Red, White, and Blue Schools program launched by the Connecticut Commissioner of Education as well as the Secretary of State. Um, and that was primarily done based upon the Enfield Youthful program. And those who were on the board at the time may remember having those students actually come and present to the board about winning that award. 77% of our JFK students achieved proficiency or above on the final argumentative writing skills assessment, as well as 83% of our high school students achieved proficiency or above on the final argument writing skills assessment. I promised I'd try to go quick. Tech Ed. 12 students participated in the College Connections dual enrollment pro program at as, as, as Nuntuck Community College. Um, why is that relevant? Because prior to that, we had two. And as one of the board members eloquently put about the partnering with the community college, um, we have a great resource right here in Enfield. And maybe a four-year university isn't for every, every student. That's not necessarily what we're advocating, but that's reality in some cases. And giving those kids a pathway to get into some sort of program to further their education is at the end of the day what we're responsible to do. World language, 100% of students who took the AP Spanish language and culture exam passed. And 50% of the students who took that exam scored a five. We also had 41 Spanish students and 14 French students who were inducted into the French and Spanish National, National Honor Societies in 2017. Our academics and curriculum department. I paused when we got to the STEAM actual department, but as I mentioned at that time, one of the biggest drivers and contributing factors to implementing that program was our academics and curriculum department. Without them, not only figuring out the curriculum, figuring out the scheduling, and making sure it can actually be implemented, that wouldn't be a reality that we're, we're enjoying right now. We've also had an expansion of, of AP offerings at Enfield High School. We used to have 10, we now had 14 for the 2016-2017 school year. We also, through our academic office, have development, 
developed and implemented a district-wide choice professional development day for February 2017 so that teachers can choose what type of PD day they'd like to take on their February day. The curriculum office also continued developing standards aligned common units of study across multiple grade levels and disciplines and 90 students participate in an Enfield's Invention Convention. 17 of those students qualified for the Connecticut Convention, con, con, this is like a tongue twister, sorry. The Connecticut Invention Convention Regional Competition with nine moving on to the state finals at the University of Connecticut. Under district-wide instruction, district-wide instruction was responsible for the Lego celebration that was held last May at the Stowe Early Learning Center where our tiny humans live. Night showcased student learning for students in grades K to five and was extremely well attended, so much so that you couldn't get in and get a parking space. But also under district-wide instruction are the initiatives for programs such as the Sea Perch, First Lego League, First Tech Challenge teams, all that compete at JFK and continue to compete in competitions. Under district-wide administration, one of the important things that we had to do under district-wide administration was the construction adaptations of Enfield High School as the physical renovation construction of the A-Wing went into full swing. What does that mean? You all remember when we started the school year as a consolidated high school, we were down a wing because the, the A-Wing didn't come in online until midway through the year. So a lot of the efforts under some of the, these areas in this department were creating those adaptations to make sure that that would logistically work. We also continued our digital communication and social media presence using our rapid notification through School Messenger, which I was indoctrinated in this week for the first time or last week, and hopefully you'll never have to hear me again, as well as Twitter, Facebook, and everywhere else online. Transportation services. You just gave me the authorization to enter into a contract with Smith Bus. What I didn't tell you during that process is, as you all know, we've consolidated our elementary schools this year into a, a, a true sister school concept. An after effect of that was we had to take every kid K to five in this district and essentially redistrict them for transportation purposes. We didn't do that alone. We don't have the capability to do that. But we had to work with Smith Bus, in, partic in particular Jesse McCruel, who I will thank publicly now for doing that and redistricting every kid that had to get a new, new bus route for the consolidation that may have changed. Nutrition services. All of our school locations are now offering a healthy breakfast. And through my school bucks, we have a revised parent charging policy that allows negative balances on accounts. Okay, I'm back to where I started. So that's what we did. Town council appropriated a budget for us last year. And we often get asked, what do we do with it? But I took a pause here because I gotta remind everyone, we did a bunch of great things. There's still a lot of things that we need to do, but we can't lose focus on why we're doing it. At the end of the day, we're all here to have an impact on kids. So anything from this point forward, you need to stay focused on the reason we're doing and asking for the things that we are, is because at the end of the day, our responsibility is to try to make the best experience to make a difference for a kid. You've seen this before. This is the district Y card. Um, I actually can't even say I recycled it. I never got rid of it. This is something that Dr. Schumann and, and, and I and administrators in years past put together. And nothing's really changed. Though the logo on the top is different, the promise we make to ourselves, to our community, and to our kids and families hasn't changed. So we already had these printed up, so I couldn't change the logo. And we still I have one on my desk. We have one in each of our buildings. But if you look at what the promises are, that still rings true to who we are. But the question comes and says, you guys have just talked about making board priorities, but what does the district have for priorities? Well, the district has goals. We have a set of goals with moving targets, with theories of action that go along with them. We also have measurable metrics that we go through as an administrative council every single year. Here's what they are. Our first goal is to provide opportunities for success for all students and further enhance the learning environment of the Enfield Public Schools. Goal two, to attract and retain high quality professionals to the Enfield Public Schools and ensure that all of Enfield's educators demonstrate continuous improvement. Goal three is to ensure the scope and sequence of the pre-K to 12 curricula and related programming is both achievable and deliverable to all students in the Enfield Public Schools. And four, 
the maintain and develop enduring partnerships between the infield public schools and businesses, educational and community organizations. Programs like Wednesday Night School were a direct result of this process. It gives our administrators the opportunity to look at things that are tangible, that can be brought into the district, that can help achieve not what we're trying to do, but also what, if we can help enhance the educational experience for our kids and families. Some of you may remember this as well. This diagram is something that's been used that as I was going through this process, I was trying to not recycle everything I've learned over the last five years, but this was one that stuck with me because if you look at the center, that talks about the instructional core. And at the end of the day, we want to make a difference in a kid's life. This is how we're going to do it. It's that connection between students, between teachers, and between content. And there's outside factors that have, an, that have an effect on that instructional core. And you can look at the different pillars of it, whether it's culture, structure, stakeholders, resources. But at the end of the day, we cannot lose focus on what's on the center of this core. And that is that correlation between students, teachers, and content. But I'll ask the question, who we are? Who are we? What are we made up of? When you look at a demographic of the type of, of what our of what the representation is in the town of Enfield, this is who we are. Very slight difference from year to year. We also ask the question, who are, who are we? And we look at two different charts that I have on the screen here for you. The first one I'll focus up on the top right is our, our breakout between special education and regular education. 17% of our students in Enfield are classified as special education, have an IEP. 5% of our students have a 504 accommodation. The remaining 78% of our kids are classified as regular education. If you look at the pie chart on the bottom, that number hasn't changed. Our free, kids in our system who are eligible for free and reduced lunch is 30%, 37% of our students district-wide. Looking at who we are, the other question is how many of there are us? How many of us are there? I'm sorry. So you may have seen this this chart in one form or another in former budget presentations, but it's important for us to, to point out how many of us there are and how many we think there are going to be in the future. So I'll put your attention to the blue chart first. That's the actual enrollment numbers going as far back as 2005, 2006. The bar charts in the orange represent what the, the bar lines in the orange, I'm sorry, represent the projected enrollment numbers that we received from Dr. Prada when he did the enrollment study uh, about three years ago. Dr. Prada, for those of you who don't know, was actually the state's demographer for the State Department of Education. After retiring from the State Department of Education, he still did some consulting work, and a previous board asked us to engage in him to do a future study on what our enrollment projections are. I want to draw your attention to two particular lines. As Mr. Barassa circled them for us. 2016-2017, 2017-2018. Our actual enrollment exceeded what Mr. Prada, Dr. Prada's projections were. Do we know specifically why? We have a theory. But even though in this, in 2017-2018, our enrollment is down slightly by a handful of students, we still have ex exceeded the number of students that we are anticipating having based on what Dr. Prada's recommend, uh, uh, projections were going to be. The theory, uh, and we're certainly seeing it when we look at our enrollment numbers and we s look at our official enrollments on October 1st, um, is that we currently have more kids at Enfield High School than we thought we were going to have. In the last two years, we've got 100 more kids there than we thought. Now, is that because kids are coming back from magnet schools? It's possible. Is that because kids are coming back from other are people moving to the area and enrolling in Enfield High School? possible. The point is, whatever you set out to do, as far as making that high school the centerpiece for the community, it's working because we have more people there than we anticipated. And there, you're going to hear a lot throughout this process, not just in Enfield, but statewide, about declining enrollments, not just in the state of Connecticut, but even nationally there's declining enrollments. That's always been a very hot topic of conversation here in Enfield. The reality is what we thought our declining enrollments were going to be didn't come to fruition. We've exceeded what our enrollment projections were by a very, very reputable source. And Mr. TCATS will agree. There's a disclaimer when I get into the next few slides. 
when we anytime I try to pull state level data when it comes to per people expenditures, uh, when I talk about things that are reported on what used to be known as the strategic school profiles, it's now on ed sites, it's a little bit different. The state of Connecticut is a year behind. So when I'm going to make a reference to state data or what we call our DERG, which is their demographic reference group, the state essentially, for those of you who don't know, they lump us all together in like-minded or like-resourced communities. So when we do our comparison, we do our comparison through the DERG because the state has a formula and a calculation that says Enfield is like other communities, so we have a reference point to compare ourselves to. Now, our DERG has changed. However, for this information, like I said, we are still a year behind as far as information that's still available. So last year when you heard these numbers, they were a year behind. Now we're a year ahead. So we're actually looking at 15, 16 financial information. But if we look at next year's, where I'm referencing Dirk F, we are going to be referenced in a different Dirk. So just keep that in mind because sometimes there's fact checkers out there who say, you're not in Dirk F anymore. We know. But for the purposes of giving you this information, I wanted to be clear that we, we are working a year behind. This is 1516, and that's what's readily available to us. What should be more alarming is when we want to compare ourselves, how are we doing against really the two subsets we can compare ourselves to? The state and our neighbors or people we're classified together with. The state per pupil expenditure, $16,579. Our DERG, as the state determines, our like neighbors, our neighbors that are most that have the most the, the, the most similarities to Enfield, is spending more than that, $16,671 per student. We're spending $14,338 per student as of 2015-2016. What does that tell us? That tells us that just like less than the state and like the people we're supposed to be compared to, we're spending over $2,000 less per child to educate a student here in Penfield Public Schools. You've seen this before. This is a chart that you were given last year by Dr. Schumann that shows where we stood in our dirt. And one thing that stood out is we were fourth from the bottom for per pupil expenditures. And we only beat Sterling, Sprague, and Wolcott. I don't know what happened in Sterling, but they beat us. And I'm not saying that in a negative way, but when people say we spend too much money in Enfield per kid, for the people we're told by the state of Connecticut on who we need to compare ourselves to, we are third from the bottom in spending. Unfortunately, I told you we're going to change DERGs, and some of you on the curriculum committee have already seen academic performance measured against our DERG, which is the new DERG, which actually has more alliance districts in it. So next year at this time, I want you all to remember, because you'll still be on the board, that we're probably going to be at the bottom because with Alliance districts comes state guaranteed funding. So that picture is only going to become worse. Our funding stream. Where do we get our money from? There's a couple of misnomers that we have. It's almost like a friendly reminder every year that we have to tell people how, we're, how we pay our bills. The town council generously gives us $69,689,185. That's our appropriated budget that we got from the town council last year. What people don't often know is that that's not exactly everything we need in order to run the school system. We get about $4.7 million in the current fiscal year in grants. Now that's grants funded from the federal government, from the state government, from private grants. Um, a lot of the programs that we run where we tell you it's cost neutrals because we have grants that can offset that, but that's an additional $4.7 million that we need to run the district. So in actuality, when people say the district costs $70 million, it's not true. It costs $74.4 million to run the district as we run it today. So the way this process works for us, and I'll get into it a little bit more in a minute, is the first step is going out to our administrative staff and asking them to go back in their buildings and departments and tell us what you need. Andy and I can't sit in our, in our offices and just determine what, what the needs are in all of our buildings. We have to go out and ask our people what it is that we need to, to include in a budget presentation. That's it. So when we went out and asked our administrators, tell us everything that you need going into next year, I have to give you a bit of a caveat to that. Now in years past, we have told people, point blank, you need to tell us what you need. We gave a little bit more tight marching orders this year. And I'll get into that in a moment. But part of it was we had a realization of what the climate was 
not just in Enfield, but in the state of Connecticut. So we gave the marching orders to our administrators that said, look, tell us what you need, not what you wish for. And to put that in comparison, traditionally, that figure that has been presented to you over the last six years has ranged from 13.5% to 11.5%, and at its lowest last year was 7.9%. So I have to give credit to our administrative staff who recognized this wasn't just a chance for us to come up with a wish list. This was just telling legitimately what we believe that we need. So they listened to their marching order and they came back with a lower number than we've ever seen. It's still probably a higher number than most people in the community think we can afford at this point in time. Now in normal years, I probably would get to that slide with that number being where it is turn the microphone off and say goodnight. However, things are a little bit different. When we look at our spending projections, of that 4.91% that the administrator said that we needed, of that $73 million amount, 70.9 million of that are what we call our roll-up costs or our fixed costs. That's just everything we currently have, moving it on next year without any, adding anything new. In addition to that, there was another $2.1 million in requests that were stated that this is what we need to continue to move the district in the direction that we're going. That's where we came up with the 4.91%. Like I said, in a normal year, from a superintendent's request, I probably would just call it a night and say, you know, okay, have at it now, this is up to you. We knew times are a little bit different, we needed to continue to work. But some of the initiatives that they requested, three additional FTEs for academic coaches. Now, it looks worse than it is. Right now, we have a 0.5 academic coach in each, all six of our elementary schools. The request was that every building get a full-time person. The reality of it is three half FTEs, or 6.5 FTEs is three positions. So it looks like three new positions. It's really just making those 0.5 people. Right now, they're split, making those 0.5 people full-time. One additional transitional guidance counselor to help with kids, as we mentioned earlier under the guidance department, is helping the kids with the transition amongst the different grades. Three additional FTEs for special education. Two FTEs in computer science. Now, I will give a caveat to this request. It wasn't necessarily, this was asked for at the elementary level, and part of it was to make, to balance out the 45 minute prep coverage that we were required to put into the schedule. And there was the request to make it more universal was two more additional FTEs would be needed to do it. And the request was to put it in computer science because putting in art, music, or PE would be a little bit more difficult. So this was the area we had more flexibility for. And because, like I said, during the computer science portion of this, this was the first year that we implemented computer science, the K-1, we thought it was beneficial to add those positions there. They didn't ask for this, I did. And I did because every two weeks since August, I sit in that chair and inevitably one of you will ask a question, what's going on with power school? And every two weeks I try to answer the best I can, but I always would put a caveat at the end of my response. That power, moving to power school was mandatory. Power school purchased eSchool, which was our former student database. We knew that getting in early was most beneficial for the district. What we also knew was we couldn't afford to bring a consultant to do the implementation for us. So we dumped it on three people. We dumped it on Dr. Kerry Wiley, we dumped it on Fred Lesiak, and we dumped it on Guy Barassa. So those three people essentially sacrificed their summers. One of them, I know, canceled a vacation because they were worried about the implementation of power school and basically have done, I can't say nothing, but they've done above and beyond what their jobs are to try to implement power school so we didn't have to hire somebody from the outside to do it. After watching them, and since I have an obligation to tell you what we need as a district, I felt it was compelling. Uh, it was a compelling enough argument from what I've seen to add that to the list of something I like to have in the Enfield Public Schools. Traditionally, we talk about technology requests and hardware requests that each building has, and we used to bring them down by building and department. For the sake of time, and that there is some consistency, I've actually just lumped them together. So you can see what the high school asked for, what the middle school asked for, what our primary schools asked for, and immediate schools asked for. Other departments combined, you can see there's a big need for iPads because they're so mobile. But those are the requests that came in. We also asked for a social worker. 
going to talk in a second about another class, but right now one of the things that we've noticed, um, and you're all very much aware of, is the increasing need at our younger levels for kids that are coming to school with, with severe behavioral and emotional issues. That has a taxing toll on some of our staff because we don't have a designated social worker at every level or in every building. Right now they're split, right now they're traveling, and one of the recommendations that came to us that I supported was, at least to this far, including an additional social worker, particularly for the elementary level. This is not a new request. Three FTEs, transition teachers. You guys were all on the board when we did this because this was basically less than a month ago when we, when we put this program into place. It's also not a new initiative, but because it didn't exist, I felt compelled to put it in here. For those of you who don't know, and for those of you at home that are watching this and want to know what the heck I'm talking about, we knew for quite some time that the amount of behavioral issues that our youngest kids were coming into school were, with were unlike things that any of us have seen in, in, in quite some time. We've had veteran teachers and administrators come to us saying, we, don't, we haven't seen the volume of behavioral interruptions, behavioral and emotional needs that kids are coming in at such a young age that there has to be something that we have to explore even further. We started having conversations years ago with colleagues saying, is this just Enfield? Is this something that's just happening with us? And the reality was no. This is happening statewide. It's happening nationally. I played you all a video from, from Representative Courtney who talked about this on the floor of the House Senate, or on the floor of the United States House of Representatives. Um, we're not alone. Our original intention, because some of the ideas we were toying around internally, was recognizing that a lot of these kids that are coming in with some transition issues, um, one of the things we recognized were that some of these kids just didn't have self-regulation skills ready to sit in a classroom for six and a half hours a day. I was here for the years we begged and finally got full day kindergarten. So I am not by any means advocating that full day kindergarten is not a good idea. But I'd be foolish not to recognize that some kids just aren't ready. Some kids aren't ready to sit in a classroom for six and a half hours a day. So how do we address that? For those kids that don't necessarily need a special program indefinitely, but they just need that pull out to get them back on track with the hope of transitioning back into your regular ed classroom. So the idea came to us, but we knew we had things going against us. One of the things that was going against us was the year had already started. How it wasn't an opportune time to try to implement something new. So our intention all along was like today, this was gonna be a new initiative we were gonna propose for next year. What changed was the volume got even greater than we had originally anticipated. So I had an obligation, and, 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 and I'm grateful that the, we had the board support to do this, but what we had to do internally was essentially mix current, uh, current resources, reallocate current resources, and try to open up the opportunity for each of our K-2 schools to have a transitional classroom that is specifically designed for these kids who come into whether it be kindergarten, first grade, who are having those issues with regulating themselves in order to, to partake in their regular ed classroom. It's not a special ed program. It's not a program that's designed to replace and it's not a fix and end all. What we're finding by some of our best and brightest people is if we just structure these kids' days differently, this is not an indefinite place they're gonna be. They can get back into their regular classroom at some point, that's the goal, that's the hope. But right now, with the amount of resources we have, we can't give the attention for these particular kids to get them in the place they need to be. So we did it. And on December 11th, we opened up three transition classes in our K-2 schools. And I'll talk about that more in a second. Kindergarten aides, you've all heard this before. Every year we ask for them. Those aren't new teachers. Those are additional su adult supports in all of our kindergarten classrooms. Partly, to address some of the concerns I just mentioned with some of the behaviors and the outbursts that kids might be having in kindergarten, but this is not new. I've, every year I've been here, I've known kindergarten aides have been on the block. We put them on there again. Theater and performing arts, and I'm gonna correct myself as I go any further, this also includes um, drama and musical theater. So don't misinterpret when I keep calling it theater and performing arts. But every year, Dr. Goodnight always asks for adding some sort of drama or theater program and for this year, we included it in the initiatives because that's what they had asked for. 
So that's what they asked for. This is how we got to it. This is the process we used to build the budget. And I just want to draw your attention to the first date. November 13, 2017 was when the administrators received all their budget preparation material, which ultimately became the budget book you have in front of you. What's different about that is if anyone can remember slightly after you were all elected, the state of Connecticut actually passed a budget. So typically, our administrators will receive this information in October. But I found it difficult to ask our administrators to put together a spending request for next school year, when in all honesty, we didn't know if we actually had a budget for the existing school year. So until the state actually passed their biennial budget, we could not send our information out to start this process. I mention that because everyone knows what happened shortly after November 13th, and we get into the Thanksgiving holiday. So between November 14th and November 18th, our administrators had new direction, did not ask for the whole world, and to get all the stuff that they usually have almost two months to complete into us essentially within 12 working days. And they did. And not one complained, not one argued about it. They came in, they sat down with us, told us what they thought they needed, but understood if we can't get it, the most important thing is that we keep what we got. But here's the process. I just want to highlight the end date on this. Um, we have to present a budget. I have to present a budget to you today. We, by town charter, have to present a budget to the town manager, which is your adopted budget, um, by March 1st. That's why you see the dates up there from January 9th to February 20th, because we need some time to physically put the document together, which is what you guys have in front of you. Um, and whatever the end result of this will be is what we need to actually get together and print. And then you sit and wait. And sometime in March, the town manager will present the, his budget to the town council. And then from March to June, the town council will review budgets from all departments and deliberate. But during there, you have required meetings such as in the March-April time frame. You will formally present your budget request to the town council. You'll have the joint community conversations. You'll have the public hearing and list all that. But I wanted you to get a flavor of this is the process. People talk about budgets when we start getting into the spring and, you know, a lot of districts you hear cuts being made. This starts for us a month after school begins in every school year. So we get into October, we're already starting to think about the following year. I just wanted to highlight for, for the sake of our staff that they did it in such a consolidated time frame. That didn't mean that things like boiler issues didn't happen when they were responsible for putting their budget together. So you saw firsthand tonight all the things that our administrators have to do in addition to trying to put these things all together. I told you earlier that I would have taken that 4.9%, ended it there, and handed it to you. But I said some things have changed. So what's changed? Unfortunately, that Hartford Current article, Mr. Barassa is very creative. He's not creative enough to actually put together a front page Hartford Current uh, article that's true. We all know what happened. The town of Enfield's budget shortfall um, due to the fiscal crisis in the state of Connecticut has resulted in dramatic cuts to education spending. We know that. Every school district outside of an alliance district has seen a 5% reduction in their educational cost sharing grant. Now, prior, I don't know if prior to or not, a few weeks ago, our Enfield delegation at the state legislature, legislature so Representative Stokes and Hall and and Senator Kissel came and had a, gave an update to the board, um, and they've been great. They've been more than, uh, they've gone over and above as far as communicating with me. I know they communicate with some of you guys. Um, but one of the things that they, they mentioned were the benefit when the bu budget had finally passed was because it's a biannual budget, that even though we're getting a 5% in, a decrease in ECS spending, which is about $3.5 million this year, it's due to be restored for next school year. And we're actually gonna make a couple hundred thousand dollars for next school year's budget and ECS funding. The problem that we have, or at least I have, is until that actually happens, we can't spend it. You can't tell me what, I, what I'm gonna spend until the state actually cuts a check. So as much as we appreciate the lobbying efforts that are happening at Hartford on our behalf, unfortunately, the state budget as you know, is based upon revenue projections. And I don't know how closely any of you pay attention to where the state falls in line when it comes to the revenue projections, but they haven't made one yet. Now, there is a false premise out that hit the news in the last day or so. That the state now has, I believe it was $900 million um, in, in uh, 
revenue over and overages in revenue. My understanding, and, and from what I've been told through through our professional organization, is don't get too excited. They didn't find a windfall of nine hundred million dollars. What that is is a lot of people are prepaying their taxes because states like Connecticut got hurt by the new tax law because you can't deduct state and local property taxes. So people are sending their money into the state of Connecticut in advance to try to get away from some tax, the, 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 the current tax advantages they have. So the state saw an influx of cash coming in now, but that's not that's a mirage. Don't get used to it. Um, I tell you all that not to be the, the pessimist in the room, but in a perfect world, I know my job is to tell you what we need. But we all have a vested interest in what happens in this community. And I don't think it would be the responsible thing for any of us to do is to just put forth a budget that says, I know we're three and a half million dollars short this year. And I know that the town is doing everything they can to make up that three and a half million dollar shortfall. And I've talked to everybody in town who knows that the town's trying to find three and a half million dollars. But I don't really care. I'm still going to go ahead and ask for an extra five million because that's what I think we say we need. It's a very delicate balance that we tried to find it as administration as to what we were gonna present you with. So there's a few initiatives that are gonna move forward in the request that I'm gonna put forth to you. I gave you a little background on what the transition teachers are. One of the questions that came to me recently was, is it working? I can't, I don't have any tangible data in my hand to tell you if the program is working yet because it didn't start until December 11th. And between December 11th, we've had two snow days and a winter recess. But I can give you a little bit of an insight as to whether or not I believe the program is working. From September until November, I had gotten an increased number of volume of calls from some of you, some of your constituents, other parents that were witnessing some of these behaviors through kids in our schools and either going on social media, calling us, emailing you as board members saying, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to ask you, how many calls have you gotten since December 11th? Because I've gotten none, particularly when it comes to our K-2 K levels. I'm not saying that's the magic pill and all our problems are going to be solved. But in the short period of time, because we have phenomenal people who are in these classrooms, that these people have gone and above and beyond what we've asked them to do. And in a very short period of time, the amount of calls, the, the amount of, of concerns that I've gotten from citizens, from parents, from other teachers, from principals, have gone from warp speed to nothing. So if that's any indication of the program working, I have an obligation to continue that program somehow, some way. And that's what we tried to do here. Going back to the theater and the performing arts, otherwise known as drama and uh, musical musical theater and drama. I bring this up because one of the benefits of going to an eight period Eagle Block is that every single student in Enfield High School takes at least eight classes. The other thing in Enfield High School that our students no longer have is study halls. What we calculated but didn't realize the overwhelming volume we were going to see two years into it is that the increased number of electives that our kids get to take is drastic compared to what we're typically used to. That's great, and it's something we obviously encourage, and we don't want to take any steps backwards in, in, with regards to programs we can offer to kids, but what we're finding out is we're running out of electives. Now, coincidentally, this year, we have a vacancy in an area that would otherwise be used for an elective. So I asked Principal Clark, as well as some of our department coordinators, and I said, what's the class sizes? If we were to replace this position that we have, what are the class sizes? Because I'm hearing that we have, a, we have a need to increase the number of electives at the schools, and I know we don't have a lot of resources to do it. So when I asked the principal and I asked, and I asked the department chairs about how many kids were averaging in these classes, we were told anywhere from 12 to 15 kids. And I said, is there a better way to utilize the position we already have without adding something new and get more kids into these programs? help the schedule out a little bit by putting more, more kids into these classes. And one thing that dawned on us was space, because you don't want to put 30 kids in a regular classroom, because you can't. But then we realized the biggest space we have in the building, the most state-of-the-art, the nicest space in that entire high school, with, as far as my opinion goes, is a room that's not being used all day long. That's our auditorium. You've all been there. 
We don't have classes. We have school-wide events that are going in there. We don't have classes in the auditorium. We have the perfect opportunity to create a theater program, a performing arts program, where we have kids right now that we do send out to other districts for a magnet for, for theater and for, for performing arts. Why We have the, the, the resources in town. We have the facility. If it's a matter of switching things up and reprioritizing that elective schedule, why would we not offer that? I'm telling you this now um, in more detail than I normally would because Mr. Neville, as chair of the curriculum committee, and those of you who are on the curriculum committee, Thursday night at your meeting, you're going to hear a proposal from Mrs. Middleton about adding drama and musical theater into the program of studies because right now our program of studies is on hold because we have to, on hold as far as going to print because we want to include these for the program of studies so kids can make the choice for doing this next year. This is cost neutral. Social worker. I talked to you a lot. I want to refer you back up to the, the bullet point above theater. One of the things we have noticed is that we built in in our transition classrooms in our K-2 schools is designated time for social work and for guidance. It has put a strain on the existing staff that we're using for social work because we didn't add people, we're just adding more to their plate. So the social work request that came in through, through our special ed request, I've honored that and included it in this, in this year's budget, in my budget request, because I think it's a necessity for kids at that level to add more social working services. I've also done it by adding, by not adding in additional areas, but by reutilizing other resources to help pay for it. Anything you hear, see here on a new initiative doesn't cost new money. You're also going to wonder what the heck this is. So back in the summer, I asked Principal Clark, uh, those of you who remember when Dr. Schumann first got here, he did something called Listen and Learn events where he went out to the schools and had assemblies with students and, and tried to get some opinions on what, what the kids were thinking. And I wanted to do that, but I wanted to do it a little bit differently. So I asked, I asked Mrs. Clark, I said, can you get together, and it would be all voluntary, I'd like to start some sort of superintendent's advisory council just at the high school. I want a cross-section of kids. I don't want kids who are just into one particular thing, just kids are, just honors kids. Just, I want whoever volunteers to do it. And I want to meet with them on a month or a bi-monthly basis to hear what they have to say. Because I could sit around all day and listen to adults tell me what we need, but at the end of the day, I want to hear from them. So we put this thing together, and I've, we only had an opportunity to meet with them twice thus far because it took a little while to get it up and running. But their requests of things they like to see different have been pretty consistent the two times that I've met with them, and they're not what I thought. You know the expression kids say the darndest things? I thought for sure the minute I walked in that room, I was going to hear nothing but complaints about lunch. I thought I was going to hear nothing but complaints about the day starts too early. One of the things they didn't complain but asked the question, it was a legitimate question to me, was, why don't we do our morning announcements on a news program like most high schools in the state of Connecticut do? And then I got to thinking, we talked about building a TV studio over there. What am I missing? Then it dawned on me, through the construction process, things had to be cut back and scaled back. So I thought, well, let me look into it. And I told the kids, yeah, it's a good idea. Let me see what I can do. And I talked to Mrs. Clark afterward. And one of the other things that they constantly bring up during these meetings, which are very productive, is are we utilizing our collaborative spaces in the new, on the new, in the new Fermi steam wing as beneficial as we can? So there's those collab spaces that are all already built in where kids can go during Eagle Hour, teachers can sign out. And I hear from a lot of the kids saying, we're just not using it because, A, it's during Eagle Block. If I want to go eat in the cafeteria and then run up there to go sit in the collab spaces, my hour's gone. And then there's too many rules. You can't eat in there. You can't sit. So we don't use it as often as we like. So after this meeting, I walked with Aaron, and I said, take me. I want to see the collab space again because it's been a while since I've been down there. And as I was walking, I was, by sheer coincidence, who was walking down the hallway with me um, was John Daig, who some of you know is our, one of our STEAM coordinators. We also call him MacGyver. So if I told him I wanted to build something, gave him nothing but duct tape and mayonnaise, he'd have it built in 15 minutes. So I said, John, what happened to the TV studio? And his eyes lit up. I know we didn't make it, but I said, well, talk to me about these collab spaces. So I said, tell you what, John, if I told you to build a TV studio, what do you need? Expecting something that there's no way on earth we'd ever be able to afford. Little did I know that Mr. Dake had the, for the foresight 
back when we were discussing adding a TV studio to the building that Mr. Dig wrote into the Perkins grant several years ago all the equipment for a television studio. We already own it. So essentially what he told me was, Chris, I need a wall and a half to close off one of the back ends of the collab spaces and maybe some tripods. But now that you mentioned it, we've got a lot of kids funneling through our tech ed program at the middle school that are taking Unified Arts, Unified Arts too, that are becoming overcrowded. And we coincidentally have a tech ed teacher who's been hounding me about, we really need to do something with video production and I can build it in the schedule. I don't need anything. We already have the cameras. We already have the mixing boards. We already have the televisions that we can put throughout the building. It's just a matter of a half a wall and a door. So because of that, and because of hearing, A, that the kids told me they wanted it, and B, that Dig already figured it out three years ago, I've included that at the expense of the materials and the labor to put up a wall and a half. So that's included in my budget as well. A side note I found out today, rumor has it, that I was going to present because Mr. Dag was asking some information at Enfield High School about a video production course and the kids got wind of it and the kids sent him a thank you video saying thank you for finally putting together some sort of video production course. Um, one of the other things we talked about as far as this course and you're also going to hear this at curriculum as well so I, I know that you guys don't like to be surprised on Thursday night was giving some cross-reference to using this course to also produce other things in other departments, such as sporting events, such as music and, and, and band and hopefully theater productions. So it, it's going to be de departmentally across the board, not just using it for a video production course. The first thing these kids told me when I walked in that room is, why don't we have AP civics courses for grade 10? That is not what I expected to hear from these kids when I walked in the room. But I went back and I talked to our humanities coordinator and our social studies coordinator, and I said, why don't we have this? And Mr. Sine, who's in the picture, said, I'll figure it out. So you're also going to hear about that, that we're going to add AP civics courses for grade 10. I'm telling you all this because two of the members of the superintendent's advisory council are sitting at the table with you today, and I want you to be able to tell your, your friends and your colleagues that I am listening to what you're saying, and I made it a priority to put your request into my budget request. That's all the initiatives I'm moving forward. My spending request is pretty, pretty simple. I told you earlier what the roll-up costs were. Those haven't changed. It's still $70.9 million, $70 million. Our new initiatives, that was $2.1 million. I took out. My request to you is going to be $70,977,330 or 1.85%. In a perfect world, I would have given you the 4.9. However, everything that I told you about the status of what the conditions of the state are, the predicament that the town of Enfield is, is in, my priority became trying to get you guys a budget that was as responsible as possible, but it maintained the level of service that we're providing for kids and families. If I were to get anything less than that, I cannot promise that we could still offer the same services that we provide currently for kids and families. Why 1.85? Some people can do math and realize our contracts are going up higher than that. Well, there's a reason for that. I want to start at the top. Every employee in the Enfield Public Schools voluntarily took a wage freeze in this fiscal year. Okay, why is that relevant? We're talking about next year's budget. What people miss is that when you have to give large numbers of employees 85% of your budget, which goes to salaries, any kind of increase, it compounds. So had we not gotten the voluntary wage increase for this current school year, I'd be asking for more money because that wage increase for next year would be on a higher starting number. And sometimes that gets lost. Every employee in the Enfield Public Schools stepped up. Last year when we, we saw that troubling times were coming, that's when we approached them. And every single employee group came to us and said, yep, we'll do it including a historic vote by our teachers association, which has never voted for a contract that didn't go through arbitration in my lifetime. Everybody voluntarily said, we want to help up, help, uh, help up and do our share. Because of that, the increases that are anticipated for next year aren't as high because we're starting at a lower number. Our insurance committee, I want to make sure I give the appropriate, recommendation, uh, the appropriate accommodations to those of you who have been on it in the past and those who are going to serve on it going forward. 
Those of you who can remember, about two years ago, we had what was classified as a mini crisis when it came to our health insurance fund. We're a self-insurance insured fund, and we traditionally have seen increases anywhere from 15 to 20 percent year in, year out. And on a $10 million line item, that's a lot of money. That's 3 percent just for insurance. And about a year and a half, two years ago, the board and town council got together and said, okay, how can we make sure we don't get in this predicament ever again? And they gave the committee, as well as us and our consultant, the autonomy to figure it out. And because we had their support and their knowledge, because of the, the elected officials on the council and on the board that serve on the committee um, are also professionals in this area, um, we have been able to put in cost measure controls to try to bring some of those costs down. As of right now, our health insurance cost for next school year is minus 1.25%. Now, I have to remind you, that's a starting number. In years past, we were given a number knowing that eventually it can come down. That's a not to exceed number. That's still the same case here. Our insurance consultant, who was Milliman, has done a phenomenal job with us since they've come back. They were our insurance consultant. They left for a little while. That mess happened. We were able to get them back. And I credit Steve May and Lisa Daly from Milliman for a lot of this. But they were able to get us back and get our house back in order. And part of that, they understood, was that if I give you a number in January, I can't come to you in June with a higher number. Our process doesn't work that way. So right now, they're comfortable with me presenting a 1.25 decrease in our health insurance line items. So that also helps. It's a big chunk of money that I didn't have to include in the budget that I'm able to get it down to where I was. And the last is something you just gave me the ability to do, and that's sign a contract with Smith Bus, which is another big ticket line item in our budget for a 0% increase going forward for next year. Those three big pieces of what we do are a big chunk of what we spend. Because of those things that we were proactive as a board, as a previous board and as a previous council, and the, and the support of the current board and council to continue down this path, we're able to control costs the best we can. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of things I don't know. One of them is retirements. Every year, you know, when we, when we lose a staff member and we replace them, there's still a savings that's attached to that. If we lose a staff member and don't replace them, it's a greater savings. By the time we get done with this process, there are times where we have a couple hundred thousand dollars in retirement savings that we can achieve by the end of the budget process. As of today, I have one retirement in my hand. There's a $20,000 savings in this budget for retirement. That's all I got. So. The bad news is I got one retirement in my hand and I can't take any additional funding out of the budget. The good news is if more are to come, there's more work the board can do to reduce the budget um, by achieving some of the savings through, through, through attrition and not have to worry about cutting staff and programs in order to get there. I mentioned the health insurance. Right now, our, you know, our joint insurance committee has done a phenomenal job to get us to this point, but the work of that committee is not done yet. We're a self-insured organization, so a lot of our higher claims come in typically in the beginning of the year because people get their high ticket of things done during the summertime. Traditionally, history has proven that our claims decrease as the year progresses. If history remains true, then maybe there's a possibility that there's additional savings in that line item. I don't know. Magnet schools, everyone's favorite subject. Unfortunately, we don't know what our magnet school rates are going to be for next year. And quite honestly, they don't know because they're in the same predicament we're in. They got cut just like we did. So I can't keep pointing the finger and say, Craig's taking all of our money. I've had conversations with folks at Craig. They have no idea. They also understand that any cut they get, if they turn around and pass that on to the local boards of education, that, that will be a drastic decrease for those boards to take. So they're cognizant of that. But they can't guarantee me it's not going to happen. Now, if through the budget process, when we get into the springtime and things more get settled more down at the state, We'll have a better understanding, but right now there is an increase built into my budget proposal for magnet school tuitions because right now I just don't know what that number is going to come in at. And the other piece that everyone, we always talk about every year, people don't understand what excess cost is until we do the budget and everybody remembers, oh, that excess cost thing. Excess cost is the percentage of money the state gives us back for high price special education cases for out-of-district placements. That number is set at 70% right now. As part of the biennial budget that was passed this year, the number was capped at 70% for this year and 70% for that for next year. But anyone who's worked in public education over the last 10 years in the state of Connecticut realizes that when those revenue projections I talked about earlier don't come in, the first place they go is they knock that thing down from, if it's 70, it's 68. In years when I started doing this a lot longer than I want to admit to, that number was at, it's supposed to be at 100. That number was at 87. 
It's now worked its way down to 70, and I don't have any confidence it's not going to go below that. So I don't know. These are things that we don't know. Unfortunately, you're not going to know this either when it's time to present a budget to the town council or it's time to send it over to the town manager. But these are things that we'll continuously keep an eye on that will have an effect on what our ultimate numbers will be. I want to give you just a little bit of a historical perspective on this. And if Dr. Schumann's watching, I'm sorry, because he will kill me. And yes, I did listen to you for the last five years and tried to take every lesson you gave me. But the world's also changed since he's left. I wanted to give you a perspective of what our requests have been over the last six years. So the yellow is what the superintendent's requests have been. So you'll see anywhere from 5.98, peaking at 9.09, .09, and then what we have for this year for my request. In the green is what you've actually approved and what you sent down to the town council. Anywhere from 3.98 to 3%, as high as 7.23, and last year you sent down a 4.53%. In the bottom, in the pink, is what you were actually appropriated from the town council. Now, with the exception of these two years, the 1.78 and the zero, the lowest percentage number on that document in the last six years is the one I just gave you. That's 1.85%, which is lower than you've asked for, and it's actually lower than most of the numbers you've actually received from the town council with the exception of two years. I'm not proud of that. This process has been painful for all of us, but we have to live in reality. If Ray Peabody's watching, I left this on here to give him a shout out. <laughs> this poor Ray, I took too many shots at him over the years. I wanted to give him a little pat on the back. But Ray was famous for saying, what's the value add and what this budget's going to be? Well, here it is. 1.85%, I keep all existing staff and programs. I don't lay anybody off. I don't cut programs. I don't, pro I don't cut a service that we currently provide to students. As a matter of fact, we do add additional things. At 1.85%, I maintain the transition classrooms at K2. I continue with our PBIS program, including our PBIS coaches. We don't lose them. And we enhance our social and emotional supports for students through an additional social worker. We're going to enhance learning opportunities at all levels. I spent a lot of time talking about our pre-K to 12 STEAM program. I'm not in a position to lose it, and I'm not going to advocate to lose it. This budget keeps the program. It also continues and adds new programs, such as theater and video, like I discussed earlier, additionally adding more honors classes at Enfield High School. Also allows, as you know, JFK just went through an accreditation process. Enfield High School is in the middle of it right now. This budget allows us to remain in compliance for the accreditation process, not just for the one we just completed, but it will also keep us in compliance for the accreditation we're about to go through at Enfield High. And lastly, it will provide athletic opportunities for students through the unified sports, varsity, junior varsity, and freshman programs. And I forgot to add our JFK programs. And I also forgot to add that the unified sports expansion is also going to move its way down to JFK next year if this budget goes through. So I'm going to end where I started and jumped in the middle. I purposely didn't put a clock on here because I promise I'll try not to be as long as I was today ever again. But this is my one shot at doing it. And you're going to have to sit there and listen. Um, but. I'm going to bring us back to where we started. What are we doing this for? I think through the accomplishments and through the work of our administrative staff to get you a number that we think is reasonable, um, we can continue to make a difference for every kid in this district. The challenge is going to be anything less than that. We can't make that guarantee, and that's not something any of us want to deal with. Now, I also understand that there's going to be people out there who see the number that I put forward, and are going to criticize it because it isn't high enough. I'm not asking for enough. And I get that, and I agree. <laughs> There's going to be people who are going to think anything is too much. I shouldn't ask for anything. should be happy with what we got. I get that, too. The challenging part this year, unlike any year I've ever seen doing this, is trying to find that balance in the middle that still meets what we need, at the same time still tries to be as responsible as we can fiscally, because we also all understand um, the, the predicament that we're in as a community and we're in as a state. So that said, I am done.
Thank you, Mr. Dresick. Um, so we have some reading to do. And we will uh, convene any questions or anything at a future date, or, or if anybody has any questions now or comments. Okay, I see none. So now I'm going to switch binders again. So that was 11B for the last hour and a half. <laughs> Not that you were counting. No, I wasn't counting. <laughs> so 11... I apologize, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> 11C, uh, discussion and action regarding appointing an elector to our Joint Facility Committee. Um, just a, a little FYI, the council voted last Tuesday to um, extend the Joint Facility uh, Committee. So we want to reappoint our existing elector because we're allowed one. So I, I entertain motions to uh, to appoint our elector. Anyone want to entertain a motion? I mean, I, a person. Or what? Uh, a motion to appoint. 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 That's the word. Appoint. I make, a, I make a motion to appoint Randy Daigle as our elector. We have a motion for Randy Daigle, seconded by Mr. Rutledge. Is there any other appointments? Anyone? Motion to close nomination. Motion to close nomination by Mr. Mr. Rutledge, seconded by Mr. Neville. Any discussion on closing nominations? All in favor, raise your hands. That's 9-0 nine, nine to close nominations. Any discussion on the appointment of Mr. Daigle? Sensing none, uh, roll call, please. Mrs. DePoe? Yes. Mrs. Hernandez? Yes. Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Mr. Neville? Yes. Mr. Vanier? Yes. Mrs. Riley? Yes. Mr. Rutledge? Randy Daigle? Mr. Ryder? Yes. Chairman Cruzel. Randy Daigle. Motion passes. So now with this, also we're just going to point out that they've also extended the, uh, that there's going to be four members from the board, uh, two, uh, two Democrat, two Republican. So I will, will remain and Mr. Neville will remain and we're going to be adding Mr. Rutledge and Mr. Ryder on as uh, Mr. Renier. What did I say? No, Mr. Renier. I'm sorry. I was looking at Mr. Renier. So again, myself, Mr. Neville, Mr. Renier, and Mr. Ryder, four of us are going to serve on that committee. And I don't think we need a vote for that. It's just a... Okay. Moving on. 11D we're going to take care of after the uh, executive session. So now we're going to move to 11E, the uh, motion we added, or the... The agenda item we added for the policy, Mr. Mm -hmm. Renier. You rewind on uh, YouTube back to uh, what I was saying before. Uh, so this is in regards to school calendars uh, 6111. Uh, we are basically changing the language in item 7 to reflect our one high school as opposed to two high schools. Uh, this uh, policy change uh, is needed in regards to us having to um, approve the school calendar in February. So at this point, um, the current motion on the table, uh, if I hear a motion, uh, we, I, I, I make a motion that we change uh, item seven um, to read, and this is for first reading. The graduation dates for the senior class will be fixed to the 185th uh, day within the adopted calendar. Uh, and is required to take place prior to ju July 1st of each year. Graduation must occur on weekdays, Monday through Friday, uh, period. Um, and everyone has a copy of this in front of them. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Devil. Any discussion on the first reading? I just have one Go question. Uh, I noticed that number one is highlighted. And I remember when we put that in there, I thought it was a requirement, not a, rec <coughs> not a, um, a guideline. Am, am I wrong on that when they were first talking about that? We we're talking about the, using the correct regional calendar committee recommendations as a guideline for setting the school calendars, with the idea being that we could we could uh, collaborate with other districts in terms of in-service days and those things and economies that you could get out of that. Um, wasn't it originally a requirement? Is it changed to a guideline, or am I mistaken? It was a requirement that was dated that was supposed to be in effect for this particular school year, but like a lot of other things, the date keeps getting passed. So. 
the graduation requirements. There was a drop date, you know, 2020. That's now been moved. So, so the state. So it's no still being. A, it's still a recommendation, but. Said, right? yeah. Okay, that's fine. Why is it highlighted? Because um, that's new. That that's new in it too. Okay. Oh, that's new too. Okay. That's fine. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other discussion on the motion? So this is for first reading. First reading. Yeah. Do we need a roll call? Roll call, please. Mrs. Depoe. Yes. Mrs. Hernandez? Yes. Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Mr. Neville? Yes. Mr. Renier? Yes. Mrs. Riley? Yes. Mr. Rutledge? Yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Chairman Cruzel? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, so that ends new business, and now we're at number 12, board <laughs> committee reports. Curriculum is meeting Thursday, I take it? We're meeting Thursday, yeah. So nothing there. Finance met and... We met yesterday, and I have four reports or report well, that's, on later. Yes. That's a report on later. Mm -hmm. Policy. Uh, policy met. Uh, we reviewed some policies recommended by CABE. Uh, the new committee is uh, working fast and diligent to the next uh, following 3,000 new policy changes. So we should be 10, good. 9,000. <laughs> well, 9,000 series. So we should be good. Um, no, but in all honesty, uh, our next meeting will be the first of uh, next month on the Tuesday, uh, and we'll be reviewing the 1,100 series. Okay, leadership met last week to go over uh, policy uh, suggestions and all that, so we did that. Joint facilities hasn't met, but I reach out to our mayor and deputy mayor and whoever else so we could get a meeting going. So if you're watching, get a meeting going. <laughs> the high school building committee is meeting this Thursday. They had a little hiatus from December's meeting got canceled, so... And then the, any other committees? I don't believe there's any. Yeah, yeah, just Ted's going to be coming to visit with us on the 23rd. Yes. Okay. okay. So now we're on to number 13, approval of regular meeting minutes for December 12th, 2017. So moved. So moved by Mr. Rutledge. Okay. Seconded by Ms. Riley. Any discussion? Uh, we just need a show of hands. All in favor? Nine to zero. Passes. Number 14, Ms. Riley. Okay, I have four months worth of them, so I'm going to lump them together. Um, so here we go. So the Finance Committee met on December 19th, 2017, and January 8th of 2018 to review financial statements for the month of September, October. November and December year to date and to examine various documents related to finances. Our review concluded that there is nothing significant to report to the board. Uh, motion, I move that we accept the superintendent's certification as follows. I hereby certify that in the month of September total expenditures amount to $7,000,000 $330,719.34 broken down between payroll totaling $5,682,784.78 and other accounts totaling $1,647,934.56. I hereby certify that in the month of October total expenditures amount to Five million five hundred forty three thousand nine hundred seventy three dollars and fifty nine cents broken down between payroll totaling three million nine hundred sixty five thousand six hundred and fifty dollars and fifty two cents and other accounts totaling one million five hundred seventy eight thousand three hundred twenty three dollars and seven cents I hereby certify that in the month of November Total expenditures amount to $5,442,233.97, broken down between payroll, totaling $3,949,550.12, and other accounts totaling $1,492,683.85. And for, I certify that in the month of December, Total expenditures amount to six million seven hundred and twelve thousand two hundred ninety two dollars seventy one cents broken down between payroll totaling three million nine hundred and eight thousand one forty nine dollars and thirty nine cents and other accounts totaling two million eight hundred and four thousand 
uh, $143.32. All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of accounts. Copies of approval for check invoices are properly documented. Moved by Ms. Riley, seconded by Mr. Rutledge. Any discussion? Do we need a roll call? Show of hands. All in favor? We have eight members present, so eight zero. So any line transfers? There are no line item transfers. No line item transfers. Okay. So with number 15, any correspondent or communications? None. <clears throat> None. So do we have a motion to go into executive session? We do need an executive session, yes. Do I have a motion to go to second session? So moved by Ms. Riley, seconded by Ms. DePoe. Any discussion? We are in executive session. We will not be returning to uh, the public. We I'll be returning, but not returning to the cameras. So good night, all.